2019 morning work session of the Portland City Council. We're back again for another budget session. Director, well, good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, who's who's starting today? I was just going to turn it over to Director Stern. All right, very good. <laughs> Wait a minute, I get, it's too quick. I get to oh, say yeah. something. Wait, Commissioner Fritz wants to Come say on. something. <laughs> yes. Oh, I forgot our new, yes, our new protocol. The is going to the dogs. Uh, but not as badly as Brexit. So I was going right? to say, <laughs> it's a okay. real toss-up. <laughs> yes, let's uh, focus on the positive. Because I want to start off by... Um, uh, noting that it's the first year as Commissioner in charge of the Water Bureau, I'm very happy to be here. And I need to say right up front that Commissioner Fish has done a fantastic job over the last five and a half years of bringing the utilities uh, back into uh, the confidence of Portlanders and indeed of the council staff. And um, in days gone by, this chamber would have been packed with both, um, <laughs> with both chambers, both levels full and people ready to throw rocks. So thank you very much, Commissioner Fish. <laughs> Um, and I'm very happy also to uh, introduce um, the Water Bureau staff. Uh, Commissioner Fish and I have um, worked very hard to make sure that despite the utilities no longer being under one portfolio, that we have developed the guidance to the bureaus together and hopefully that the um, presentations will be seamless. Uh, we directed the bureaus to keep the combined bill increase to no greater than 4.53%. Uh, and the Water Bureau has met this guidance in their re requested budget. I also am very grateful to the Portland Utility Board and the Citizen Utility Board who will be making presentations today um, follow after, after the presentation by the Water Bureau. And Mike Stur, our fantastic director, Gabriel Soma, Soma his a fantastic deputy director, uh, will be giving the presentation and uh, introducing the rest of the panel. Now, Mike, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go now? <laughs> Good morning, Mr. May. Did I? No, I'm on. Is it green now? Green. Is it green? Is it green? Hello? What? Nope. It works. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Good commissioners, um, invited guests and budget committee. Uh, my name is Mike Stewart. I'm the director of the Portland Water Bureau. Um, I need to do a couple of introductions here. First on my left is Cecilia Hewn, our finance director and the person who actually knows all this stuff. I'm just a talking head. Um, Gabe Solmer, our deputy director. In the back seats there, in case Tom Reinhardt's got trickier questions than I can answer, he's threatened me already. Uh, I have Teresa Elliott, our chief engineer, Jeff Winter, our budget director. I'd also like to mention uh, Alan Warman. Where are you, Alan? Alan Warman, who is the co-chair of the Public Utilities Board, and Janice Thompson here in the back hiding behind a column who represents the Citizens Utility Board. And also Rob Martineau of the AFSME um, unit that represents many of our employees. Thank you. So, three takeaways. Well, four. We've met all the budget guidance provided by the mayor and Commissioner Fritz. Number two, system resiliency, which was in the mayor's guidance and we have been working on for about 15 years. Number three, regulatory compliance. We are a highly regulated water utility. We have to comply with reams of rules and we do. And last, something that we're most proud of, uh, our financial assistance program. So, you didn't know the Water Bureau was this simple, did you? God knows what the budget guys do with this, but there's only two divisions in the Water Bureau, so this should be a really short conversation. Um, because of the way our money is set up, we have two divisions, the Hydroelectric Power Division and the Water Division. The Water Division is what you all know and love as the Water, water Bureau, and we'll, we'll get to Work. that. Hydroelectric Power Division, uh, Basically, we take in around $2.4 million in revenue right now as we went through uh, last year, or maybe it was two years ago, in excruciating detail. Uh, we are meeting our expenses. Um, 
we're meeting expenses, building reserve, and we have some uh, renovations to do, updates of, of the power equipment. And sometime a few years from now, we'll start actually cutting a profit then. Uh, but for now, we're just meeting expenses. Now going to the water division. What's a water system do for you? It provides clean and safe water to the tune on an average day of about 110 million gallons, plus or minus. We protect public health. I like to think that, that we're the largest public health system in the city. We touch everybody in the city every day. We take very seriously our public health responsibilities that sometimes can make us be a shade obnoxious about certain things like backflow prevention devices and so on. Uh, but that is our job. We provide water 24-7, regardless of the weather. We have an emergency response capability. We provide water for fire hydrants throughout the city. Every 500 feet, you'll see one of those fire hydrants that cars have a unique attraction for. Um, and we also do the planning to make sure we can provide for our future needs. In the main break department, uh, we didn't actually, Ty likes to play with the numbers, but we didn't actually break a record, but we met a record this year for main breaks, 92 in the freeze uh, season. About 200 breaks annually that crews respond to whatever time of day or night they occur and in whatever conditions they occur. So what are our priorities? First and foremost, clean, safe, reliable drinking water. Our water must be safe to drink. We have tons of regulations to follow, EPA regulations, Oregon Health Authority regulations. We want to make sure that when our customers turn on a tap, uh, the water actually comes out of it. We want to make water available to protect public health and for fire protection. We want to make sure the system is well maintained now and for the future. My, my crews are always asking me, we're a 100-year system, right? We think 100 years. Um, that's actually two-thirds of the life of one of our pipes. Uh, so we tend to think very long term. In the past 14 years or so, we have made a tremendous investment, thank you, City Council, in seismic resilience. Um, and we continue to work on that. We've got more work to do, but we're, we're in as good a shape as I think we have a right to expect to be right now. And last but not least, we want to make sure we use our resources wisely. Now I'm going to turn it over to Cecilia, who can talk numbers. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Um, so I'm on slide eight here, and the total water resources for the Water Bureau next year, uh, the different color of money is on the left and how we will be using those resources um, to fund the, the planned expenditures are on the right. Um, the Water Bureau is an enterprise fund, and what that means is we are funded primarily by rates and charges. You see on this um, slide, half of our resources will be from monthly charges. That's our water sales revenue. A third uh, will be from um, issuance of water revenue bonds. Um, we have plans to issue revenue bonds this fall, later this fall. Um, Portland's water re uh, revenue bonds are rated AAA. It's the highest rating by M Moody's Investor Services. And um, I say this at every presentation. Uh, we are among less than 10 water-only utilities with this high rating. So, the, of course, the um, benefit of having this high rating, aside from bragging rights, of course, is that it provides us with um, an opportunity to borrow at very low rates, keeping our cost at the lowest when we need to make water system improvements. Um, so, capital revenues um, include system development charges, um, installations of mains and services um, that we um, do for development. Um, I'll just touch very briefly other uh, revenues and sources um, that the I'm still on the same slide. Um, that is um, drawn from our fund balance, interagency revenues, interest earnings. And again, all that um, resources is uh, what's going to be planned to be used on um, the uh, planned requirements that is directly to the right 
um, capital our capital program for next fiscal year, making half of what we plan to spend next year, um, will be funded by bond proceeds, our capital revenues. Those are the only resources that can be used for capital program spending. Um, and a portion of our capital program will also be uh, cash funded with current revenue. Um, the capital program, 60% makes up three projects. The three projects are our share of the Portland building that we'll be paying out next year, um, the uh, work that we've been on doing on the uh, Washington Park Improvement Project, and um, the Willamette River uh, Crossing Project will be underway next fiscal year. Um, th about $30 million of our capital program is used to, um, uh, for ongoing replacements of our system. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to um, cash fund part of our capital program. Those for our ongoing replacements are remains. Those are pipes in the street, or hydrants, or meters, or services. An ongoing replacement uh, program for those. Um, so cash funding um, a portion of our capital program makes a lot of sense for that reason. Um, we use um, current revenue, of course, um, to pay for operations and maintenance of our uh, water system. Um, our debt service, um, about a third of our revenue goes toward paying our annual debt service. Those are, for the most part, investments that we've made to our water system in prior years. Um, and it, other expenditures include utility license fee, um, general fund overhead, um, uh, pension bond obligation, um, pension obligation bonds, as well as um, our transfers to the rate stabilization account. So color of money and what we plan to be spending next year. Excuse me, can I stop you there for a sure. sec? I have a question. Um, can you explain to me uh, the difference between how, um, how residential uh, customers and wholesale customers, how the rate applies to one versus the other? Um, so our, we have um, 19 wholesale customers, and we have contracts for each one of them. And the provisions in I'm the sorry, contract- you have what? 19 wholesale customers and there are contract agreements that we have with each one. They're all very similar, um, and it, the provisions in the contract are very specific on how we set rates for them. Um, for the most part, the rates are based on um, the assets that are used to serve them. So we have um, our assets in a bull run, our groundwater, um, the conduits that brings the water into town. Those assets are used to, it, it would be um, uh, charged to them on a depreciation basis and on a rate of return. Um, the, the retail customers for, I mean, excuse me, the wholesale customers, for example, would not be paying for anything that's in the distribution system because it's not used to serve them. So the pipes in the streets, in front of our streets, are not expenses that they would be paying for. Um, so what we do is we, we set rates for our wholesale customers receive um, anticipated um, and certain amount of revenue from them, and then everything else, we figure out what else is left as far as what requirements we need to cover for the expenses that we have, and then we go about setting the rates. All of our retail rates, uh, so excuse let me, me, retail customers <laughs> are one You're getting way too uh, detailed. Thank you, I appreciate Sorry. your detailed response. Um, it, are the rates, are the, uh, are the retail customers subsidizing the wholesale contracts that no. you have? Uh, no. We, we use a, what's called a cost of service model. It's a standard model in the industry. And basically anybody pays the cost that they use to get the service to them. So inside Portland city limits, stuff that's inside Portland city limits with a few exceptions are not part of the cost calculation for wholesalers who are outside the system. Only those pieces that are actually used getting the water to them. A good example would be if you were Twat Valley Water District, you're paying for the dams, you're paying for the conduits coming to town, you're paying for Powell Butte, you're paying for the Washington County supply line. That's all you, that's all that's in your cost pool, not the whole system at large. And finally, I appreciate uh, helping me get educated about uh, how this happens. Uh, you have a, a ratepayer assistance program? Yes. But it's only for homeowners, is that correct? We also have, um, last year, council approved um, a multi um, multifamily assistance program 
for those living in multifamily units. And we work with Home Forward to provide those assistance. And how does that work? So one person I forgot to introduce, but I'd be happy to bring her up here, is Corbett White, who's the head of our uh, financial assistance program. So last year, um, effective July 1st, uh, we did uh, work in partnership with Home Forward for them to administer the program for our multifamily customers. And basically what happens is the customers are directed to call 211. And then from 211, they are directed to an agency in their area that will assist them with getting assistance with their bill. So with their rent, actually. It's not for their water bill specifically. It's for rent assistance because, as you can imagine, in a rental unit, lots of them do not have it allocated out for separate for water. It's simply to help them to avoid eviction. And so we are working with Home Forward um, in that program. So as a renter, how would I know that well, actually, there's an opportunity for me to get assistance? So Home Forward, Home Forward has um, lots, is working with a lot of the agencies throughout the community. So if you're a renter and you were saying, listen, I'm having difficulty um, paying my rent. Right now what we're doing is a lot of outreach, trying to get the word out, but Home Forward already has a pipeline that they're using to be able to service renters who are in need. follow-up question that uh, that is for either those that are living in public subsidized housing or those that are living in private no it is not okay. it does not allocate it for um, uh, renters who are in subsidized homes no okay so it's just for those that are living in private um, like you said. buildings that are owned by private yes okay So how does Home Forward get to people who aren't in public subsidized housing? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sure I'm making this more complicated than necessary, but how does Home Forward get to people who are not living in public subsidized housing? What's their advertising strategy and tactic? It is through many public agencies. So it would be um, the community agencies like ERCO, um, the SEI, I'm trying to think of all of them. Um, um, so unless somebody's connected to a community-based organization that they are partnering with, I mean, the average renter, like myself, um, I just get charged. They just tell me what I'm supposed to pay, and I pay it, right? Uh, but I would know if I needed assistance that there was a place that I could go to and talk to someone. So that when you say that Home Forward, which I know does excellent work, but... They work with one segment of the population. I think what we're realizing is most middle class people are suffering from trying to pay their utility bill. And so I'm just trying to figure out how do people get that info. So that's why we really have gone on a campaign for outreach to community, um, like community alliance of tenants. We're working with them. We're just trying to get the word out to the community that this assistance is available. So if you're asking if there's an in-house program for that, no, there isn't. We have partnered with Home Forward to the, in the administration of the actual funds. But in terms of the outreach piece, that is something that we are doing. And we have also lots of partners because we do out outreach on lead, piping, lead pipes in homes. And so there's over a dozen organizations that work with us on that. Do you remember the number? In our I don't remember the number. I'm sorry. But there's a lot of community, 10 to 20 organizations, or community, yeah, community organizations who were regular partners with that also have the information about this program, as does 211. And as you can imagine, if a, if a renter is in need, the first thing they start doing is doing research. And as they start talking to various community agencies, that's where we're doing the outreach to make sure that they realize there is a program to assist renters. Okay, um, budget by program. Um, the water budget is organized by seven programs, and you see this on, that on the side. The programs encompasses both operating and um, capital budgets. This year, with the change to the budget process, the budget is presented at a level um, below the seven programs. Um, some of these programs have uh, one program offers. Um, distribution program has eight program offers. Um, in total, there are 22 program offers that we developed. Um, we want to respect the time that's allotted to us, so we won't go through all 22 programs. 
um, in details. Um, that information was uh, provided in our budget submission. Um, we did put together a um, very high level summary of each of the program. It includes the capital budget, the operating budget, the staff that's allocated to the program offers. That's in the back of this presentation in your packet, um, starting on slide 26. Um, so I'm just gonna take a few minutes to highlight some of the programs for you today. Um, but before I start that, I wanna mention that we have a total of 614 positions that supports operating um, the water system and making capital improvements to the system. Excuse me, one more time. Um, sure. You have a, you mentioned that uh, you'll be going out for a bond. Yes. Would you talk about what that process looks like? Um, we work with debt management to identify the amount of uh, the bond issues that we need to fund work the capital. With who? Debt, city debt management. Um, to identify the amount of uh, bonds we need to issue to fund the capital program. And uh, we work to um, update, we work with bond council, city debt management, and um, updating our official statement. It's probably about half an inch thick. Um, it has a lot of information about the water system, the um, economics in the area. Um, and then we make a presentation to our um, rating agency. They rate our um, utility. And then it actually goes out, um, CD debt management again, facilitate all of this for us in doing a competitive bid on the, on the bonds. And is that in context to all the other bonding requests and, or does everybody do their own? <laughs> Can I take this one? Specific? Certainly. Tom Reinhardt, Chief Administrative Officer. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty, correct me if I'm wrong, I think your question really relates to the different types of bonds that we issue. So in the general obligation bond that uh, Fire and Rescue is considering, that's a request to Portlanders in terms of bond revenue that would be supported by the tax base. What Cecilia is describing are revenue bonds related to their enterprise fund and their ongoing stream of revenue from ratepayers which we have much more control over internally in terms of issuing and presenting to the credit agencies and as a part of their long-term capital improvement plan, we manage that as an internal function of the city and my team in debt management you know, assists, us with that. assists with that and figures out the timing and selling them at the best price for the city. Is that, is that helpful in terms of? Absolutely okay. helpful, thank you. <laughs> and, and the bonds that we issue can only be used for our capital improvement projects. It's very specific on water system assets. Um, that can only be uh, used to fund. Um, so again, 614 positions. Um, I do wanna add that um, in the budget request, we have not asked for any new positions for next fiscal year, okay? So um, on to the highlights of the programs. <coughs> Starting with treatment, um, 17 million in this program. 14 million is in the capital program for two projects. That's for filtration and corrosion control improvements. Um, those were council approved projects for us to comply with regulatory uh, requirements. Um, we do expect that this slice of the pie going forward will grow as we move from design to construction of those plants. Uh, transmission and terminal storage, of the 38 million in terminal storage, 35 million of that is for the uh, Washington Park Reservoir Improvement. That's one of the three large projects I mentioned earlier. Distribution, um, 100 million in this program. 30 of that is for ongoing replacements of our water system assets. Um, again, the pipes in the street, that's the distribution mains, our hydrants, our meters, our services. Um, we wanna be uh, maintaining our system. Um, the Willamette River uh, Crossing Project, um, $39 million, that is um, part of that 68 in distribution mains. Just wanna sort of identify which pie, slice of the pie these um, three items are in. Um, customer service, um, the financial assistance program that Corbett spoke about um, is in customer service program offer. Um, th uh, the, the Bureau's financial assistance program provides bill discounts to qualifying low-income residential customers. Um, we also provide plumbing repair assistance. There's also a safety net as part of that assistance program. Last year, council approved increasing the low-income discount to extremely low-income um, customers. Um, we also have that financial assistance to those multifamily uh, units, and we now have three full-time positions that focuses on providing assistance to customers that are in need. Uh, support, uh, bureau support of that 65 million, 39 million is for our share of the Portland building contribution. 
Um, our work on our strategic planning effort, um, equity initiatives is also part of Bureau support. Um, you're gonna hear a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Um, and lastly, I just wanna mention um, employee investment. Um, employee investments includes two of the apprenticeship programs that the Bureau runs, um, along with the safety program. Um, our two apprenticeship programs are uh, water operations mechanic, uh, apprenticeship program and the utility workers apprenticeship program. Um, the great thing about these apprenticeship programs, it has helped the Bureau hire a more diverse workforce. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna um, stop with all of the numbers um, and details of the budget and turn it over to Gabe. Thank you. Good morning, Gabriel Salmer, Deputy Director for the Portland Water Bureau. I get to talk about some of the other pieces of the program offers, uh, aside from the numbers. Um, and we were excited to see this new budget process because it allows us to highlight some of the other pieces that we don't always get to talk about in the budget process. So one area are the key outcomes and service levels. And this is an area we've worked with very closely with our Portland Utility Board members to understand what would be helpful in demonstrating how the Water Bureau is meeting its goals in these different areas. We s certainly track a lot of performance measures as do most of the bureaus. Um, everything from how long a customer is on hold when they call for uh, customer assistance to the number of hydrants that we install every year. But we want to do a comprehensive review of all of these performance measures. It's a lot of data, but what is that data actually getting us? How can we improve these programs? So this summer, just as a little spoiler alert, we are doing this as part of our strategic business plan in really analyzing what these performance measures give us, what information, and how we can tailor them to better improve our projects. Um, but you can see just a few of the ones that we have now. Obviously meeting all of our regulatory requirements is very important for a water bureau uh, and for public safety. Um, as Cecilia mentioned, our AAA bond rating. Um, and then some of the newer ones, implementing a financial assistance program. We want to make sure that we're doing that equitably, that we're reaching all segments of the community. So we need performance measures that help us track that. And then of course, um, improving uh, how we incorporate equity into all that we do, making that a how of what we accomplish. So a little bit more on the equity initiatives. And again, this, is, um, this was actually highlighted in the program offers, which uh, I think was really useful to people reading that. It's a, um, just as important as the numbers are all the narrative that, that are in the program offers. Uh, and one, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Smith for her and her staff's help um, at OEHR for their thought re thoughtful review of our programs. Uh, they've asked a lot of good questions. We are asking those questions as well. Um, and I also want to highlight both CUB and PUB um, for asking these questions. We agree with CBO and with uh, Office of Equity that we need to measure affordability. That's an important metric that we uh, we can use to evaluate our programs and how well they are serving our customers. We're in year three of the racial equity plan, um, and one, some of the key successes there, we've uh, certainly increased our engagements with communities of color, um, and we're very proud of our outreach to particularly the Muslim community. It's an area that we have not um, done in the past, and, and we're uh, glad to be reaching out to, again, to all segments of the community. Um, as well as developing an How equity. are you doing with your workforce? I'm sorry? How are you doing with your workforce as it relates to equity? So we have uh, two areas, and workforce equity and then service equity. So how are we providing equitable service to the community, and then how are we creating uh, equity in our, uh, in our own workforce? And so Cecilia talked a little bit about the diversity pieces, but in terms of equity, that's been a highlight of our strategic business plan process. Um, and just bringing everyone to the table to get all of those perspectives and then understanding what we need to do for recruitment and retention. Um, so we know that we can do better in both of those areas. And you're and in year three? In year three. Um, so we've done a couple of things. We have, um, we've continued to do a lot of training in terms of equity, um, both the city mandated trainings or uh, city offered trainings, but also going uh, above and beyond that with our workforce. 
um, and then bringing in specific equity consultants, especially on our strategic business planning process to understand how you embed that um, in your vision and mission. And I think a, a summary might be we've made a good start and we're hiring an equity manager even as we speak. And so there's certainly a lot more that we can and will be doing. I'd actually like to, I'm a little mindful of the time here. It's now 10 o'clock. I know we dived into questions before the end of the presentation. It seems like a good point to stop and ask Dr. Smith to do uh, ha have some comments from the Office of Equity's perspective since we're on that piece now. I don't want it to be lost at the end of the time. Okay, and some of it you spoke to. Good morning, everybody. Um, and so... Uh, as you said, the rate increase, that was one of the things that we highlighted um, pretty heavily and how that... It was it <laughs> Okay. Um, and how that impacts um, particularly uh, vulnerable communities. Uh, and uh, another piece um, obviously was uh, around the hiring of equity manager. And we're hoping that as an office, we can support what's happening with our equity managers, and not just in water, but across the city. Um, another piece um, that, uh, when you spoke about the recruitment and um, retention piece, um, and I know that you have a lot of positions that have not been filled, and you're not, you know, requesting additional positions. And so I think that there's probably some um, assistance that we might be able to lend to think about the ways in which recruitment um, is happening and the places where um, you're advertising, right, um, for positions, and um, then the retention piece. And I think that really goes to um, a conversation around. Um, sort of workplace environment and culture and how that contributes to retention, um, as well as ways in which uh, employees of color, employees who um, are diverse um, make connections, um, both within your bureau and outside of that, right? So some continuing conversations around that, I think, uh, would, would lend themselves well, so. I just had a comment that I was really pleased when I took over the Bureau that already employees get paid work time to attend the Bureau Equity Committee and to participate in leadership roles on that. Mm -hmm. So that's to me a foundation. As I say, we've made a start and we're going to do more. And then just to finish up again on the uh, program offers some of the innovative approaches that we're using. I uh, just wanted to talk just a minute about our strategic business plan because it's something that we haven't done and uh, nor has it been done in the city. It's a really risk-based approach, um, a new way of thinking for us of what keeps you up at night and how do we reduce or mitigate those risks. And those run the gamut from things like how would we uh, prepare and um, adapt to life after an earthquake to the loss of institutional knowledge um, and some of these retention issues that we were just speaking about? Um, and how do we promote a collaborative and equitable work workplace? Uh, we're launching the plan this summer, but we've been uh, already seeing the benefits of this approach in just engaging all kinds of perspectives. People who have not had a seat at the table uh, within our own bureau are now being asked for their opinion and um, asked to collaborate. And then last year, I just wanted to mention that we moved our, east, our customer service center, this is our walk-in center, um, to the east side to our uh, interstate facility. And we've already seen an increase in walk-in traffic for that. Uh, we would um, say that that is because of having that center where the population need is. It's also served by uh, Max and by the bus system. And uh, there's parking and there's bike parking. So we've seen an, uh, an improvement there in just getting the services to where people are. <coughs> So, technical challenges driving the, the infrastructure. Technical challenges driving the infrastructure program. Uh, first and foremost is regulation. Uh, our immediate challenge is the lead and copper rule and the ongoing LT2 treatment rule, which drives covering the reservoirs. Um, those two issues drive our major construction projects. Aging infrastructure. The system is more, more than 100 years old, and the average age of our pipes is about my age. That's, that's kind of scary. Um, so the system is old and can deteriorate. About 37% of our CIP focuses on replacing components in the system as they age out. And that's the principal means that we use to replace pipes in particular. 
unlike BES who can drive a camera down their pipe system and kind of take a look and see what it looks like, uh, you can't do that with a water system. It's all done by aging and break rates, and we have a complex model called a Weibull curve. That if you're into that, I'll see you later. I can explain it. Uh, that determines when we replace pipes. Um, last but not least, the seismic risks. Um, we have done a lot of work in the last 14 years on seismic risks. All the new reservoirs that we've built are seismically up to date. Our uh, maintenance shop and warehouse are among the most seismically up to date buildings in, in the city. And anything we do going forward will be seismically resilient. What do we actually have in this system of ours? Well, we have a protected watershed. Uh, we don't actually own the watershed. We operate it cooperatively with the U.S. Forest Service. They're a fantastic partner to us. We work very closely with them. <clears throat> we have 27 wells, 36 pump stations. 80% um, of our customers receive their water courtesy of gravity, which is a very good thing for our ratepayers because nobody's figured out how to charge us for gravity yet. Um, and one of the things we try and do as we run around modifying and fixing the system is maintain that 80%. Uh, your average utility spends about 20% of their uh, bill on power to pump, and we spend somewhere around two or three. Mike, I just want to, uh, with a time check, we've only got 10 minutes left. <coughs> so if you can focus on, um, as I say, we had some discussion um, Let's earlier. skip system value slide, you can see that, we're worth a lot of money. Condition assets, um, I think we're, we're actually in pretty good shape as a utility goes. Um, if you just look at the first big three bars, that's the majority of the system, um, either uh, good, very good, or fair. And we try and keep the poor down to very short list. We have plans underway to take care of the poor, either mitigation strategies for them or, or replacement strategies in the future. And in some cases, it's run to failure. Mike, is poor mostly, is that mostly pipe infrastructure? Is, is there any way you'd characterize that? Um, our, our, uh, we maintain a steady pipe relation, replacement program about eight to 10 miles a year. Over the coming years, we want to up that. But right now, our capital budget is dominated by the three projects that Cecilia mentioned in the beginning, okay. Willamette River Crossing, Filtration Plant, what was the third one? Uh, Portland Building Contract. Portland Building. Um, which to me is a seismic resilience project to the Portland building. Um, so can I ask about the uh, water increase? You're requesting a budget rate height mm -hmm. next year. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Want to talk about that? <laughs> um, rate, uh, rate increase. Are we moving on to slide... Um, 20 then. Uh, so our request for next year is 7.4 percent. Um, BES is going to be asking for a 3 percent rate increase. So the combined on that is 4.53. Um, the direction that we received from Commissioner Fritz and Commissioner Fish is to submit a budget that supports that combined rate increase. Um, we have met that directive. Um, looking ahead, um, the water uh, Five-year rate forecast is 7.4 percent each year. Sorry, you should probably advance this. Oh, and if you just go back to slide 17, sorry, you know, I think in previous years it's been an hour for the each utility, so that's why we're a bit compressed here. But on page 17, you can see that a lot of the increase is because of the requirement to do the treatment facility. So that the blue it, um, with the big rate increases coming through 2028 is the filtration plant, which is 500 million dollars. I see that, and I see that we spend very little money on customer service, so I'm just wondering how does the public know, how, A, how does the increase impact, right, the, especially uh, renters who are going to have to pay this increase because it's going to be passed on to them. But uh, I, so I think that is a challenge. We do have, a, I think, 100 people in the customer service department, so... The, yes, yeah, so... It's $20 slide. million, dollars, so it's, it's a small portion of the budget, but it's probably it's the largest customer service... Um, service that we do, the dwarfing city. the information referral service, which is maybe 10 people, I want to say. 
So yeah, on slide 17, the, that's the capital program. So this is capital work on the system. So that's, there's, that's the reason why you see a very small slice um, related to customer service. So I can get back to that. This one here. I love being one. new because I can ask all kind of questions that <laughs> you know I'm sure other people have asked, have wondered about. I would be happy to give you a more a private briefing. I, I have a question about the increase before we move um, to the next thing. So the water bill is pretty expensive already for poor landers. Everybody agree with that. And a 3% could be very impactful for some families. Uh, do we have study how can the community uh, absorb a 3% increase? Am I, or am so um, I'm going to go ahead and jump to slide 21 then. Um, the water portion of the bill you see there is the blue part. So the current total combined water, sewer, and stormwater bill is $112.79. That is a lot of money on a monthly basis. Water portion is about a third of that total bill. Okay, the 7.4% moves that $39.24 by $2.90 to $42.14 a month to our typical residential customer. Those low-income customers, qualifying low-income uh, customers, um, their bill will go up by $1.45, half of that, because they're receiving the 50% discount. Those that are getting the 80% discount, they will see a $0.60 cents impact, again, only to the blue portion of the bill a month. And what is your definition of low income? So um, low income is 60% uh, of medium household income. Um, they get the 50%. Those that are, are at 30% of the medium household income gets the 80% discount. Median household income as compared to median area income as compared to it's federal it's poverty line? It's city of Portland. S Portland's it's, medium narrow, it's narrower than the big metro. I've never heard the term household income used as a determinant before. Is that unique to the Water Bureau, or is that just a? Let me try. The, the program set by City Council. I think it's, isn't another term medium family income? Yeah, medium household family. Income. Median household. M which yeah, is it's M H I. Median area medium income. Family. Is it medium family? Sorry. The normal measurement. It's the MFI, so probably more what you're familiar with, household or family. So it, is, it is MFI? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I probably was more familiar with the EPA's That's thing. Terminology, <laughs> you know, means different things to different people. So Before you are, get off of um, rates, these estimates, is this estimate usage averaged over the year, estimate usage in the winter, because I'll tell you my bill's a lot higher than that in the summertime when I'm using water and doing my lawn. So I'm just kind of curious when you're using these figures. <laughs> well, certainly in the summertime, we can expect our customers to be using a little more water than in the winter. But we do look at our total customer base. And on the average, on a monthly basis, is about five units. So that's 3,750 gallons a month. OK. And just please keep in mind that we do have winter average for our customers, which means that we look at your bill, the first bill that you received prior to April. And then that it bill is what we will use to determine what your sewer cap will be for the summer so that you're not used, you're not penalized for using like in your garden, um, doing, you know, washing your car, whatever the case may be. No, I'm well aware of that. I've okay. been examining the bill very closely. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just wanted to point that out. <clears throat> so I'll just move us along. I'm gonna wrap up here in just a few minutes. Um, Total bill impact to the, again, to the combined water, sewer, and stormwater bill, $5.11 to our typical monthly customer, typical residential customer on a monthly basis. Um, so how do we compare? We water bill portion of the bill, um, how do we compare? If you look at the green bar all the way up to the white line, that actually puts us to the left of the city of Beaverton. With the requested uh, rate increase for water, um, moves us to the right of Beaverton there. Um, essentially, we're right in the middle of all the jurisdictions that we looked at um, around us, the cities um, and the water districts around us. This is comparing, again, the, only the water portion of the bill, average bill to other utilities. 
So this last slide, I, I'm just going to mention that um, for a penny, we but, deliver. I'm a, sorry, but we've got two minutes left, so we do need to give our um, cup and pub folks at least a chance to come to the mic. I, I apologize, sorry. folks. I, I obviously timed this incorrectly, uh, not anticipating the questions throughout the presentation. So um, sorry to interrupt, and okay. we do all have the entire binder available. So thank you. We'll bring up uh, Alan and Janice. Could you give us um, a, just a brief summary of your letter, which we do have, and then we'll give the a chance. Well, good morning, Mary, Mayor, Commissioners, and uh, Community Advisors. My name is Alan Warman. I'm the co-chair of the Portland Utility Board, and I'd like to send a little information about the pub and, s and our recommendations specific to the Water Bureau. Then at the next section, Rob Martineau, uh, a pub member, will also share his uh, comments of our board uh, later. The board was created uh, to be an independent citizens oversight body for water and BES for the city council's management of these public utility bureaus. Our purpose is to act on the behalf and for the benefit of the community members and ratepayers of Portland. The pub invested more than 20 hours reviewing the proposed program offers, operating budgets, major additions and adjustments to the five-year capital improvement plans and decision packages for both bureaus. Pub received a significant amount of support from both bureau directors, staff, and ex officio members, as well as the city budget office. I think the shift from decision packages to program offers has been very challenging for staff as well as pub, but we believe the change will pr provide more transparency and accountability for the future. We're very grateful to Commissioners Fish and Fritz, leadership of both bureaus and support of the pub. We appreciated the shared budget guidance between the offices and the commitments for keeping the budgets aligned. Thank you. The commissioners directed the 4.53% for the combined rate increase and the budget submitted have met that requirement. I wanted to uh, also, I'm sort of shortening this up for your yeah, um, I'm, I'm appreciation, but I have three director. recommendations. We're gonna mess up your entire schedule here. What, what's, uh... So we built a five minute break into today, so we do have a little bit of flexibility. Yeah. Thank you. Within the next month, uh, you'll see a written letter from the pub with our complete recommendations, but I'd like to highlight three items. The first of all is affordability. The water rate increase is forecasted at 7.4% each year in the requested budget, as well as the five-year forecast. This is substantially higher than the rate of inflation, and though infl uh, filtration is a component of the higher rates, there have been significant increases in capital projects uh, over the original estimates. With the projected rate increase, the water bill could double in 10 years, and PUB remains concerned about the impact on ratepayers and particularly the most vulnerable within our community. PUB is very supportive of the low-income discount program to mitigate some of those concerns, but affordability is very, very concerning to us. Mount Tabor. There is one decision pack, pack, package w uh, with a requested $1.1 million in general fund support for the preservation work at Mount Tabor. This is the fourth year of funding and the pub continues to express concern with the $4 million uh, commitment from prior city council. As a result in the inequities with limited resources. Pub appreciates CBO's recognition of the need to revisit this issue, but urges council not to shift the expense to utility rates. 
since this would even further cause a impact, negative impact on affordability. The pub recommends that it, if funding for the preservation work continues, it remains with the general fund. Performance metrics. A critical component of the pub is early development and implementation of meaningful and measurable performance metrics to monitor success of the programs for both bureaus. The pub recognizes that the water bureau is in, in the midst of strategic planning effort that connects to metric development and both bureaus are working through a shift on the program offer budgeting. Effective in both bureaus depends upon developing a budget process that includes key metrics that can be used to evaluate services and program offers against measurable outcomes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I'm Janice Thompson, the Oregon Citizens Utility Board, or CUB. Um, I'm not going to go through everything, but I'll try to hit the highlights of the memo I distributed. Um, I do include an initial uh, introduction about CUB and why uh, we're showing up here, um, in particular for kind of new members of both the council and the Community Budget Advisory Committee. So I'll just let you read that, um, but I do want to highlight for... Um, Commissioner Hardesty, that your question about wholesale customers, for example, is like when I first started this work, that was a topic I like really dug into. So I can resonate with you, with your like, you know, how does this work? How does this work kind of uh, questioning? Uh, um, just the, the very bottom paragraph on page one just kind of outlines kind of our, what our MO is. We typically do a phase one memo that's targeted more to the bureaus and the commissioners in charge. This memo is targeted to the mayor and, and uh, in particular, but all co uh, commissioners, because this sets the stage, I think, for the mayor making decision about what to include or not include in his budget. Um, so there, the, the first few pages do um, summarize input that's pertinent to both bureaus. And so when you see the BS Bureau, or remember, you're going to see a lot of repeat. So, um, so this, this presentation should be shorter. The BS one will be uh, longer. BS will be shorter. So first, um, you know, summarizing the combined rate increase discussion and how it meets budget guidance. Um, Cubs saw, you know, significant advantage of having uh, one commissioner in charge of both bureaus, um, understanding that that's, you know, uh, was probably never likely to be the, the practice forever. Uh, but given that, it was um, really great that both commissioners, Fish and Fritz, worked together to, um, to develop a joint uh, budget guidance memo. So this summarizes the information you've seen elsewhere about the impacts and whatnot. And it does add up to some sobering figures, um, but I think it does reflect the understanding of the two commissioners in charge of the um, re resiliency and regulatory drivers of rate increases. Though um, Cub has long been a supporter of the very slow in income assistance programs, and obviously these figures highlight why. Um, the, the next two su suggestions are really um, as much for CBO, you know, which faces a real challenge as always uh, with you know uh, analysts that shifting from portfolios and. Um, but the first, the middle paragraph there, I'll just let folks read. But it's just as the low-income assistance program is paid for and it involves uh, management by both BES and Water Bureau, um, it might be helpful if the CBO analysis of that component is, is combined. Um, in particular, it just seems like there are questions that could come from either the Water Bureau or BES um, uh, analysts that the Water Bureau um, would be particularly well suited to answer. So on page two and three um, highlights some past work. Um, 
and thinking that, uh, that CUB has done in terms of just the underlying income inequities issues that facing uh, Portland. And um, the baseline, of course, is that all utility investments need to be prudent, strategic, and provide good value. But, but then it does seem like there's some opportunities to target um, rate relief mitigation efforts. There's been a reference to the low, you know, the recent expansion of the low income um, assistance program, increasing the crisis voucher, allowing an option uh, for the very low customers. But I also want to mention that there is the monthly billing option, which obviously doesn't reduce the bill, but for folks, um, uh, you know, who maybe can afford to pay the bill, but not when it comes in this big quarterly chunk. Um, it can just be a, a financial management. Um, not saying that's enough, um, but it's also interesting to take a look at um, the fact there are Portlanders who I think can afford these rates, and um, to just to keep that in mind as well. And one interesting statistic it's kind of highlighted at the top of page three that I've been tracking for a while is um, a, a surprisingly small number of folks with quarterly accounts have requested a change to the monthly billing. Now, um, we definitely support and have, have, have urged more outreach on this option. Um, but even if like that participation rate, you know, quadrupled, um, there would be you know, a fair number of Portland utility customers whose quarterly bill preference indicates that they can deal with those higher rates even when they come in those amounts. I'm not, again, I'm not saying, you know, that you don't want good value and, and careful, um, but I think this provides some insight into the importance of the low income assistance programs. And CUB um, is particularly interested and was supportive of the, the new multifamily crisis assistance program. Excuse I mean, me, Janice. Yeah. Do you, um, do you support the premise that because somebody changes from one method of payment to another that somehow no. it is uh, indicative it, of whether or not they are now struggling to pay that bill? It's a financial management tool. Yes. That's but all it, it is. So, uh, so one, that was question one. Number two, um, over the next five years, that means that uh, rate payers' rates are going to go up about 20%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't see any mechanism to recalculate whether or not more people would need assistance with paying their utilities. Did you see anything or was there conversations about what's the impact going to be long term? Because $5 today a month might be okay, but... If we keep adding that every year for the next five years, all of a sudden you're talking real money. Right. No, that's exactly why these are sobering numbers and I think the various comments about evaluating affordability and looking for more opportunities um, for assistance are really important. Um, the the uh, one thing about the multifamily crisis assistance program and how it addresses um, low income renters regarding cost relief of the water, stormwater, and sewer systems is that this is a national problem and it's not at all unique um, to Portland. And so, um, you know, I think it is a good reflection on the efforts of the Water Bureau and the commissioner of charge at the time, Fish, to kind of keep plugging away to develop this um, program with the existing uh, home forward short-term rental assistance. And that effort was already, this has been designed from the beginning to be evaluated and um, uh, CUB definitely looks forward to that evaluation um, because this could be a real area of expanded and um, in, in terms of, you know, an avenue to kind of assist with that, with those longer term trends, right? Because right now, the, the financial resources are, are relatively short. Um, 
I'll just let folks read page three and four. It does relate to um, a request that's actually in the CBO budget that, however, does assess uh, uh, ratepayers of the utility related to the staffing level of the pub. So it gives them, I was actually on a blue ribbon commission that um, uh, evaluated and made an op uh, op uh, recommendation to revamp an, an earlier in, internal oversight group to form the pub with a clear recommendation to have staff capacity. Um, but there's questions about what that staff capacity is. Uh, we have, could well be persuaded that the request for 50% increase to one and a half over one FTE is justified, but not without um, a more rigorous evaluation of pub operational practices and efficiency opportunities. This is all happening within the context of the pub having some um, staffing transition changes, which I know is a challenge for them and to CBO. Um, on page four, there's just some specific comments that I cross reference with the CBO report. Um, when, it, and because we agree with many, but not all of the CBO uh, recommendations. So I just thought I would, you know, save time. I would just zero in on where there's um, either disagreement or some concerns and, and added context. So um, I'll just let folks read themselves. That first point, there's a long discussion about the Mount Tabor decision package um, that is will be a continuing issue, um, not only as the council sorts out how to honor, you know, the end of the, f the four um, year agreement, but beyond. Um, the, at, at this point in time, however, Cobb does recommend that the mayor include in his budget the uh, 1.1 million direction to develop requests from Commissioner Fritz that was included in the bureaus. Um, there's a short discussion here on new costs for represented classifications and two comments at the bottom of page five, beginning of page six, on two items that were not mentioned by the CBO. One relates to Dodge Park, um, and the other relates to decorative fountains. I mean, Cub has consistently not supported use of repair money for the decorative fountains uh, because the word decorative in there um, indicates that using water for that function really to us is not an essential element of a system supplying drinking water. Janice, uh, on, on Dodge Park, um, we have, we're proposing to change it from overnight camping to day use, which um, we believe is a de minimis expense and the cheapest way of keeping that facility available for water bureau uses. So um, in the past, it's been subsidized for overnight camping and that's going to go away. Great, so I stand corrected on that. Um, the, um, so there's, the, in the last budget cycle, there was an understanding that $600,000 in the Water Bureau repairs for decorative fountains was just gonna be a one-time thing. Now that's evidently gonna be repeated again in this um, budget cycle. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Director Kennard, I just want to remind you, I have a heart right. out at 1230. I, I don't know how you want to manage the yeah. remaining time, but we're still in our I have first about bureau two and sentences we're 20 left. minutes over schedule. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Please wrap up. <clears throat> Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, the decorative fountains, so, so we understand kind of what's going to happen again and just want to highlight that. Um, it is, there is gonna be an upcoming review of equity evidently in the provision of services provided by Portland Parks and the primarily downtown location of decorative fountains. Does seem like it should be included that in that equity discussion. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like that might not occur given the ratepayer uh, source. So hopefully that can be addressed. Thank you. Um, so we are uh, running behind. Thank you, Janice. I'd like to have the Bureau of Environmental Services come up. I want to remind uh, and let Council know sort of as a tool to help us manage our time going forward. We do have an 
hour um, slot available towards the end of our work sessions on April 1st that is sort of a to be determined and a hold slot. So if there's topics where you feel like we're running out of time and you're not getting to discuss uh, as fruitfully a, a certain topic, we can, we'll, we'll make a list, start making a list of topics we want to bring back for discussion to help move things along Great. and sort of table things. Great. Uh, I appreciate getting a thorough letter from the uh, Cub. Is there a letter also from the Pub? Yeah, it was. You, I don't know that I. Will be coming I also got a copy of our recommendations. Okay, if I could get a copy of that. Oh, it has not. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll look forward to could that. I, Appreciate could it. I ask where would we ask the questions regarding Water Bureau? I had several comments as well as questions. Uh, please send them to, to me, and I will, we will coordinate all questions and follow up responses for all members of the, the work session. And comments, because we want to make them public Absolutely. versus. Absolutely. And those will be distributed to all of us, even if we don't ask Correct. the question. Can we see Correct. the questions and the responses? Correct. Questions? Thank you. Mayor? Commissioner Fish. Uh, colleagues, the Bureau of Environmental Services protects public health and the water quality of our local rivers and streams by providing wastewater and stormwater management services to more than 600,000 customers every day. This requested budget is the second under the Bureau's 10-year strategic plan and reflects the Bureau's long-term strategy to achieve both system and financial sustainability. As Director Jordan often says, BES is in the 100-year business. When we invest in our infrastructure, we expand, we, excuse me, we expect the benefits of that investment to be shared for generations to come. The Bureau's strategic plan helps focus that ethic into actionable steps that will create one of the first truly sustainable utilities. Last year, the Bureau presented a plan for long-term rate stability with 3% rate increases into the foreseeable future. Today, I'm proud to be here with just that, a budget with a 3% rate increase despite increased regulatory requirements and service expectations. And as you've just heard from the Water Bureau, we have worked with Commissioner Fritz and her team to ensure yet again that the combined utility rate increase is again below 5%. This year, I also directed the Bureau to prioritize resources to advance strategic goals, including process improvements, equity and inclusion, and rate stability. And we now begin the difficult work of implementing our recently adopted strategic plan, which we are calling Future BES. The team at BES um, uh, is taking a hard look at all aspects of what we do, who we serve, and how we serve them into the future. We begin the work of ensuring our programs meet the needs of our customers, our system is resilient, and our assets, including hundreds of miles of pipes, are in good working condition. I'm pleased to turn over today's presentation to Mike Jordan, Director, Bureau of Environmental Services, and Jonas Beery, Business Service Manager, to walk you through our brief presentation. Gentlemen. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, members of the Budget Committee. We're happy to be here today. I am going to thank everybody in the room. Thank you for being here, and we're going to move on. Um, so uh, 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 I'm going to skip the next slide. Just keep going, Jonas. Uh, you have our presentation. You can read it. You also have our detailed budget. I'm sure you have some questions. We're going to try and get through this as quickly as possible so you have some time for those. And obviously, we can get back to you with written responses also. Let's go to the planning for the future slide. Um, the commissioner's right, we are in the 100-year business, uh, and that may be overstating it just a bit, but what it really means is that every decision we make, we have to take the long view of things. Um, the Iroquois proverb that leaders are encouraged to remember the seven generations of the past and consider seven generations into the future when making decisions is very apt for our bureau. Um, we took into consideration, we're, we're in roughly the third year of an organizational transition to shift to this long view and, uh, and uh, predominantly revolving around uh, asset management. Tops on our list in building this budget is reinvestment in our assets. We manage a $15.2 billion set of infrastructure, uh, the largest that the city owns. Uh, understanding its current condition, its useful life, and the impact of failure is critical to our success. Our system is a combination of gray infrastructure and green infrastructure. And when I say green, I'm not just talking about the 2100 Green Street facilities that we have, but also 300 miles of stream corridors, hundreds of miles of drainage ways, and hundreds of wetlands within the city limits are all part of that green infrastructure. Uh, us. 
allowing and building a system that optimizes the use of those natural facilities lowers the cost of our infrastructure over the long term and the maintenance of the gray infrastructure over the long term that we have found. Um, strategic plan implementation and metrics have been mentioned. It's also one of the drivers for us in this budget. In your packet, you will find a list of 21 metrics that the uh, uh, Bureau submitted. I will tell you those metrics are inadequate to the task. Uh, we have to do some restructuring of those, particularly in light of the new programmatic budget. We'd like to align them to those, and oh, by the way, many of those are not benchmarked against other things, like other like utilities or industry standards, and that's a goal for, for us, excuse me, as we move forward. Um, also, we've mapped, and as the commissioner alluded to, are working on restructuring our biggest business process, which is our capital project production process. Two-thirds of our budget has to do with capital, and that's our biggest business process. We have been restructuring it. We, are, we, we just launched last week a new project management office, which we hope will drive uh, more product through the, through the process, if you will, so that we can reach the goals of reinvestment in the system that we want. We've also restructured our financial planning uh, that you've heard about. Uh, we are managing now to a 3% rate increase target forever, basically. Uh, we, we will have a slide that talks about our history uh, later on. But we want to make that a predictable, and we certainly are in interested in further conversations that we've been having over the last few years about affordability. So uh, we, we're restructuring our finances also. Let's go to the equity slide. Um, our equity efforts fall into three major categories. Um, we are working, we have an equity plan that's been adopted by the Bureau and has been acknowledged by <coughs> OEHR. However, uh, we've received a, a, a letter from Dr. Smith. She asked many great questions about metrics and baselining some of our work and we look forward to working with you on those. But in this budget, you will also find multiple programs that have to do with training and equity literacy of all of our staff so they understand their, their position, their point, their role in equity. We also are attempting to diversify our workforce by working with BHR uh, on enhanced outreach uh, processes to try and get uh, more diverse candidate pools in our recruitments. Um, but, and it was said in the previous presentation also, we have work to do on our internal culture. So um, what's been the barrier, Michael, to getting a diverse workforce in BES? I'm sorry, I didn't hear What you. has been the barrier to you achieving your equity goals? We have a long-standing relationship for a number of our uh, professional uh, disciplines, uh, engineering and environmental science, that have predominantly been recruits that come from local universities. And the local universities themselves in those programs are not very diverse. So we have to do much greater outreach nationwide, nationwide to try and get more diversity in our pools. We now have a... Uh, 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 a, a dashboard that has been produced by BHR, which is a great tool for us because it allows us to see the diversity of our candidate pools at different stages of the recruitment process. That data will help us understand where to focus our efforts, whether it's in broad recruitment at the very beginning or we're actually losing candidates through the process. So that data will help us to figure out those, those issues. And then on the other side, you're doing a lot of major contracting. What does that look like? Sure. Um, we have both uh, targets regarding uh, trying to have minority women emerging small business contractors in uh, both our prime uh, uh, contractor programs and the sub subcontractor programs, along with our uh, professional technical uh, engineering contracts. Uh, and our on-call contracts. So we have a number of different categories that we're uh, uh, attempting to get uh, uh, greater participation in. I will say that um, we do a lot better when we do uh, specialized contracting processes like um, uh, enhanced processes uh, to not just do low bid contracts. Um, about half 
roughly, the, the target anyway would be about half, it's not currently half, but a significant amount of our capital program is pipe replacement. And pipe replacement, quite frankly, is basically a commodity job. It's number of feet, get it in the ground, and we've got probably a handful of contractors in our market that could do each other's bids. Um, that's, they've tightened the margins down that close on that on that on those bids, and they're low bid contracts. Mm -hmm. And so we, quite frankly, don't get as good a performance from minority women-owned businesses as we could if we did a different kind of approach, which we're working with procurement on right now. Uh, Lester Spittler is a breath of fresh air, and we're working on different ways that we can um, so get, I, get better performance in those contracts. Thank you. I really appreciate your thoughtful answer. And just know I'm asking every bureau these questions it's because okay. we continue to say we have a vision. Sure but I don't see it in action. And so when I, I ask these questions very intentionally and I'm, right. it, it will just be a theme with me. So that's okay. just know I'm, that I'm going I'm gonna... a little fast because I know we're behind the gun here. But, right, and um... so my last question is, um, our promotions, our evaluations, how are you measuring whether or not the people working under you actually are sharing your vision? Um... Well, that's a great question. Uh, we have not incorporated um, uh, uh, the diversity goals that we have as a bureau into things like performance appraisals. So those aren't listed there. We are working on that as we speak. Uh, we, have two, we have two new equity uh, managers that have just started this week in our bureau. And uh, one of their jobs will be to help us incorporate and institutionalize those kinds of things in the tools we use for both evaluating people for pr promotion, but also whether our managers are actually meeting targets uh, for both recruitment and, and promotion. So those are, it's a great question. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Where were we? Um, let's move on to the next. You said we could do this in 20 minutes. We're going to stay on track, and we're going to answer follow-up questions and do follow-up briefings as necessary. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, let's go to the budget objectives slide, uh, which is slide number five. Thank you. Um, I have talked about the long view. We do budget one year at a time, and this year's budget um, has uh, characteristics and drivers that uh, I really only want to talk about one of the many that are listed there, and that is the invest in assets one again. Um, the two priorities that you'll see in this budget um, is more uh, resources being put into condition assessment. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a slide that's coming. And then um, aligning, uh, excuse me, and then process improvements. The formation of the project management office uh, is uh, a realignment of resources to try and get greater throughput in our, in our process uh, to uh, build um, uh, capital projects. Uh, let's go to the condition of assessment sli or asset slide. Second column is uh, BES. As you can see, it is the largest, uh, uh, by value, the largest set of assets that the city owns. The good news here is that the majority of the, of the system is in good or very good condition. Um, that, those are predominantly the newer elements of the system, the uh, combined sewer overflow tunnels, the larger pump stations associated with that system, and the collection system that is built in what we would call East Portland, what used to be called Mid-County, uh, the Mid-County project. Uh, as painful as that was, uh, the, the system is now relatively new out there and in good shape. The difficult parts of the system are inner east side and downtown, the older parts of the system. They range in, in age from 80 to, a, to over 100 years and uh, are in need of replacement. But the most worrisome part of that column is the top of it, the yellow bar. Uh, it is the TBD bar. It is the part of the system that we actually don't know the condition of. Um, those are predominantly force mains. As Mike Stewart mentioned, you can't run a camera down something that's under pressure. And those force mains are under pressure, and so we have to actually take them out of service to be able to run a camera down them, and it's a more logistical challenge for us. But we're working on that right now. Some of the older pump stations are part of that that we don't know. And then lastly, and probably the biggest part of that, 
is the surface water system, the management system, in parts of the city we rely on under, underbuilt uh, transportation system that has ditches and, and no real curbs or gutters. Uh, we rely in some places on private lines that have been built over the years before development that occurred before it was in the city. Um, and so we have to actually go out and try and assess all those public and private issues, the mix of stream corridors and piped surface water uh, predominantly in the West Hills, but in other parts of the city also. So those are the ones that kind of keep us up at night because we don't know enough about them. Uh, move to the five-year capital program. Um, as you can see, we're targeting eventually north of $150 million a year in capital. Um, the two things to note on this slide, one, the, hundred and the first column, 2020, the top bar, the grayish bar, um, is the Portland building contribution uh, from BES. It's about $37 million, I want to say. Uh, that will occur uh, this coming year. Other than that, the brown bar in the middle is the one to pay attention to. It is uh, wastewater treatment, and we are expanding our uh, investments there over this, what I will call the short term, the next five years, um, mostly due to regulatory requirements um, at Columbia Boulevard, which causes us to have to expand our secondary treatment at Columbia. Um, it, uh, it also, because we're doing that work, it has beget kind of a, 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 a cavalcade of other work that needs to be done on the site. And altogether, we're going to spend somewhere around $170 million over that five-year period. We also um, are looking to rebuild almost completely the Tryon plant, and those numbers are baked in here. We are in a discussion with Lake Oswego about an alternative course for Tryon, and so uh, I would say stay tuned. Those numbers are baked into these projections, but that could change uh, over the next few years. Um, beyond this five years, if you were to look at the bars beyond the five years, you would see those bars in the middle shrink as we get done with the work at the plants, and you would see the green bar at the bottom expand. We should be probably somewhere around $75 million a year in just pipe replacement. And that's what that green bar represents, really, is the maintenance of the system. So if you looked out in the five to 10 year range, you'd see those bars change uh, over time. So Jonas, do you want to talk quickly about uh, your Sure. So, so thank you, uh, Jonas Beery, uh, business services manager. Um, I appreciate there's probably 100 pages or more in our budget. Uh, that's um, a limited space to distill all we do. We're going to talk about it in just a couple minutes. So as noted, more than happy to respond uh, to questions and, and follow up and use our time uh, efficiently today. Just a very quick overview of what the budget looks like, a requested budget just under $600 million. Uh, as uh, Director Jordan mentioned, about two-thirds of that is related to capital. So I want to highlight here the uh, dark green piece of the pie debt service is our payment this year, $180 million, uh, which reflects uh, the payment on bonds that we issued to fund prior capital improvements. Uh, a big part of that is the, is the big pipe uh, CSO project. Uh, the other big piece there is $177 million. That's the capital improvement program uh, for the current year. So the capital improvements we're making uh, in the current year. Uh, the sum of those two equals about two thirds of our budget. Uh, I do want to highlight that uh, as an enterprise bureau, like the Water Bureau, uh, we are approximately 90% funded from ratepayer revenues. Uh, that's by far the bulk of where we receive uh, the resources to fund uh, these budgeted expenditures. Uh, about 10% comes from system development charges, a small portion from uh, permit fees that are uh, charged on a cost recovery basis, but, but predominantly ratepayer funded. Moving to the next slide, uh, again, not, not going to talk about this in great detail, uh, but, but there's um, a lot of detail in the uh, budget document itself. We have about 28 program areas. Uh, those are loosely aligned, mostly aligned around our six op, uh, organizational groups. Um, not surprisingly, the largest of our programs is the uh, Capital Program Management and Controls. That's where the CIP lives, the Capital Improvement Program lives. Uh, the other two largest programs, not surprisingly, about 25 to 30 million each, are the uh, wastewater 
wastewater collection system and the wastewater treatment system. As, as you might expect, those are the two largest programs. Uh, again, I'll skip over a lot of the detail here. Um, but I do want to mention um, that this budget cycle was a really good learning exercise for us. Uh, we learned, um, I think, about how to talk about our programs in a different way. I don't think we've ever at this bureau talked about the comprehensive, complex work that we do uh, in a 50-page summary of all the things we do. Um, that's a lot, uh, but, but we do a lot, and we've never really talked about it in that way. We learned, I think, a bit about ourselves. We learned where some of the dollars are maybe not uh, uh, pointing to where they should be. Uh, we've made some of those corrections this year. We expect to make some more of those uh, in the future. Um, and I just would flag that in the context, as our director stated, of the strategic plan, um, this process, this alignment really fits with the way we're thinking about the services we provide, the way we talk about uh, the programs, the way we think about equity, the way we think about uh, program narratives. So I wanted to flag that while um, we've identified some imperfections, um, it really, I think, has been a good exercise in us uh, aligning with the way we're thinking about our bureau strategically and really sets us up, uh, I think, to uh, improve the way we communicate and be transparent about uh, budgeted expenditures going forward. Um, lastly, I, uh, this is sort of the technical piece, I guess. Um, as always, we have a huge budget. Um, we, we did do a significant number. Uh, it's, it's always a very challenging exercise. We adjusted about 140 line items in our budget. Uh, that includes additions, um, adjustments, and reductions. Um, all that being said, huge budget. Um, the total uh, operating uh, change is an increase of about 10 and a half million. Of that 10 and a half million, 8 million of that is non-discretionary. PERS, COLA, healthcare, things we don't really have a, a strong decision in making. Uh, so despite all of that change, despite the size and scope of our budget, our operating budget on a discretionary basis is only increasing by about 2 million, about 2 and a half million. Uh, and that reflects uh, reductions that some programs took to accommodate increases in other uh, areas. Uh, the, all those details are reflected in the program offer narratives uh, in, in the write-ups. Um, I, I don't think, Mike, in the interest of time, I'll go through any other adjustments. Um, okay. I know we do want to talk, I think, about uh, FTE. Yep. Uh, so we'll move to that slide. So I know that uh, uh, one of the things on the hit parade always at budget time is, is how many FTE are we asking for? And we're, as you can see, asking for 20 uh, FTE, regular FTE, I will say. Nobody's permanent. Um, and uh, one, uh, 1.9 in limited term. Um, we're transferring a couple of employees uh, just organizationally to BTS for their, uh, that will take us uh, up to about 610 or 11-ish uh, employees if those are all approved. This is the third year that I have told basically the same story at uh, budget and that is our goal over 10 years is to be a financially and physically sustainable utility so that we're replacing the infrastructure as quickly as it is wearing out in all the different component parts. We are behind in that. After 15 years of big pipes sucking all the air out of the room uh, and deferring maintenance during that period, we are well behind. We need to spend more money on engineering. We need more folks doing construction inspection. We need bigger design contracts. We need bigger construction contracts. We need more construction contracts. Um, uh, the short answer is we gotta get bigger if we're gonna be sustainable over the long time. Do we have to be prudent about how we do that? Do we have to be concerned about affordability and our rate profile? Absolutely. But uh, we believe we're in a unique position over this decade or so to make the transition to a much more robust investment in the infrastructure while pulling down cash reserves to a prudent level, not a dangerous level, and keeping our rate increases at a predictable about inflationary 3% per year. That's the model we're working on this FTE ask and quite frankly the entire budget reflect staying on that track. So that's where we are with that. Did you have a question? I will, Commissioner. Let's skip the rate slide. We've talked a lot about rates. Basically it says we're gonna be there. Um, this is just, if the 3% were approved, the bill would be $75.76. That's the sewer and stormwater component. You heard about the water component earlier. Um, Similar to the pie chart that Jonas showed you, the predominant amount of that 
bill goes towards either paying debt service from the past capital, contributing to current capital, or putting money away for future capital. So uh, operating uh, only represents a little more than a third of, of that budget, of that bill. And then the last one is just the combined bill that you've already seen. So with that, um, I will say, comparatively speaking, for our portion of the bill, um, we are about in the middle of the chart when you compare us to other like uh, metropolitan areas in the country, um, but our rate increase is smaller than most. The reason for that is we've already done our CSO and we've baked it into our, into our financials. Most other folks are at the front end of their CSO obligations to EPA and they're raising rates faster like we were 10 years ago. So that's about where we are comparatively speaking also. And I'll stop there and maybe we, I think you have others who want to talk about us. Two, two of our, so Rob Martineau and we also have uh, the cook. So can I ask Michael another question before he leaves please? Yes. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I will ask you the same question I asked the Water Bureau. I'm very concerned about how this 3% a year, it sounds very small and benign, but when you add it with the water increase, when you add it with uh, your own demographic information about who bears the brunt of the cost, what are you going to do to make sure that you're not overburdening certain segments of our community? Uh, it may not be this year, but next year or the year after, it's going to be a real concern. Uh, Commissioner, I think affordability of the utilities is a challenge. Our equity problem is not that we can't afford to have a robust low income uh, uh, system to help ratepayers. Our problem is the structure of the way we build uh, bill people and our access to them has created an inequity even in how we treat folks that are of meager means. That's our big challenge, is getting over that equity problem. And we think there are some ideas that we could put forward that uh, would help us get to that. It is not an easy thing to do, though. We've, we've worked on it pretty hard, and we've been frustrated so far. I appreciate that, but I... I I, I appreciate the fact that you've been thinking about it, but I, you know I'm talking to people who are living it every day. I understand. And so there's a sense of urgency that I have that it doesn't appear that you have. Well, actually, let me, let me jump in on that because I don't think that's fair. Um, go go to slide 12, um, if we could, just for a second. Um, during the last since uh, 2012, we've actually cut the projected rate increase in half. What the council has said, however is that to get to a fully sustainable utility, we're going we're gonna to have a soft landing at 3% for a number of years so that we can reinvest in our assets and bring all of our assets to, I think it's, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it very good and good? Very, yes. Is, is that very our goal? Very good and good is our goal. Our, our goal is very good, yeah. not, not fair. Or good. Good. Good is okay. good enough. Good is good enough. <laughs> so so um, we, we do have the luxury, at least on the Bureau of Environmental side, um, of uh, having reduced rates pretty significantly, but now uh, staying at about 3% for a period of time so that we can reinvest in our system and not have catastrophic failures and other things which are going to cost us more in the long run. The question of how we soften the blow to our ratepayers is something that um, what I would like to do, Commissioner Hardesty, because we, we have this new program uh, that we've adopted as council, I'd like to give you a complete briefing, soup to nuts on it. And I'm sure there are ways we can expand it, improve it. I'd love to get your feedback on that. That's probably an hour, just in fairness uh, to, to making sure we give you all the information. Um, um, it, it, is, it is an unfolding experiment. But yes, we, we understand the, the rate impact, and we are <clears throat> cognizant of the impact on not just low-income folks, but middle class folks. And if there are things we can do better, we'd love your suggestions. I appreciate that, Commissioner. I, I just want to make sure that I, when I have these questions, that they're on the public record. So there's no disrespect to you, Michael, or disrespect to you, Commissioner. But these are questions that people are asking me. And I want to make sure that there's a public conversation about it. So I won't be silenced by asking questions that I think are pertinent uh, to me making good decisions on this council. 
Director Jordan, I have a couple of questions, uh, and I'll, I'll be brief. First of all, uh, I appreciated uh, the document, and uh, I also want to acknowledge the, the, the budget office's good work on this in highlighting the work that's been done around capital improvement projects and the planning process associated with that. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge that hard work. Um, they did raise one question in the end of their uh, suggested budget. They said with regard to the question of strategic targets, uh, you were very forceful in saying that you want to take the next year to identify what the appropriate strategic targets are against which we would judge our investments. And they said that that is great, but that you should also have strategic targets in place for this budget year. They weren't gonna give you a complete pass. Is that a fair statement to the budget office? So what, do you, what is your response to that? Because it, it made sense to me. So what's, what would your response be to that? Well, strategic targets in light of the capital program are relatively easy to identify, both, both throughput, output, targets, we aren't even reaching our output targets, let alone outcome targets. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're trying to reorganize the business process and reassign folks to different parts of it to reduce the barriers. But um, I, I don't have any problem with picking some of the data points that we have. I really want to try and align the ones we pick to the programmatic budget that we're developing we believe that we're gonna do some changes to those programs going into next year, since this year was, I'll just say, a little clunky. Uh, they're not perfect. They're better than we thought they were gonna be going in, but they're not perfect. And so my goal is to align our, let's say, metrics to the programs that we identify in our budget and make where we spend money much more transparent to what we're getting for it and have, tar have indicators that show that. That's my goal. Good, and, and last but not least, I, I just want to acknowledge and thank you for the degree of work that you put into both meeting uh, the uh, stipulated goals of the budget uh, and the budget guidance in particular, but also in the new structure of the budget. I noticed that, that you were very explicit about how many light items you had to move around and you called out the fact that there are some line items that are still going to be in more than one program, and right. that's something we have to resolve over the course of the next year. And so I, I just want to say I agree, and if there's any way I can help oh. you or Commissioner Fish do that, um, I'd like to do that. But I, I just want to acknowledge the hard work you put into that, and I really appreciate it. I appreciate it, it Mr. Could we Mayor? borrow some of your staff members, Mayor, no. just to, uh, to work yeah, on this? Actually, uh, <laughs> Kristen is probably the right one, because lots of bureaus are going to have this right. same issue, and you're, you're one of the only ones to actually overtly call it out. There really is a question of how do you define who goes into what program. And it may just be that we need to revise what constitutes overhead. So I, I think that's sort of the next iteration or the next evolution of this process is to really define that. And I think we're also going to get a lot of feedback on how from our budget citizen budget advisors and others about how this works. I was a skeptic. Um, I'm now sold on this idea of looking at the budget by program area. It's, but it's extremely difficult to re rewire everything to get to that point. And so I appreciate that, that this is the budget year that we're experimenting and next, next year we'll probably find our, our sea legs, if you will. But uh, so we have our, um, our uh, Rob Martineau is here from the uh, Portland Utility, the, the, the Portland but Utility. Could I ask two questions Please. so it yes. doesn't get lost in the mix? Because it's good sure. to, sure. You know, I'm not sure who you'll need. I'm gonna go to equity. <laughs> and um, I was curious of your employees, you were talking about your employees makeup and trying to hire more diverse workforce and the pipeline, which as a school board member, I understand about not having a diverse pop pipeline out there to hire. But what percentage of your employees only require like a high school education and a little above, don't require a college education? It can be ballpark. I'm not asking would, for exact. I would say uh, probably 10%, maybe 20 at most. Okay. And 
uh, the Water Bureau said they have an apprenticeship program going. We Do have, you? yes. Okay. In, so, in some areas, we've just started one for electricians because we can't get any. Okay. So. What schools are you working with to, to create a pipeline? Can I get back to you? you I, I mean, we we work with some of the obvious ones with well, Oregon State and Well, Portland the obvious State and, one for diversity but, is David Douglason. I have to sit through uh, a career technical education yes, breakfast. Yes. There was not a single member from the city yeah. at those tables. It was all private and education people that were working with the pipeline mm -hmm. and it's with the 3,000 students, over 50% English is not their first language. Mm -hmm. The diversity is there, but mm -hmm. we don't see it. And we have a very robust mm -hmm. career technical program, and we're known for being working collaboratively with our partners. Uh, Frida, we'll also, we'll also, in our response, uh, tell you about a internship program we have with local high schools, which has been very successful in exposing young people to careers. Very diverse, uh, excuse me, very diverse uh, um, cohorts, and we'll tell you a little bit about that as well. And it, okay. it, it covers uh, the, the school districts that you were mentioning. Okay, because so, I have seen in the past that isn't happening, but in the future, if they attend that type of breakfast, they can see more so they can be more creative on how that can be used. We're, we're happy to reach out to David Douglas. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, and Community Advisory Board members. My name is Rob Martineau. I'm a water operations mechanic at the Water Bureau, president of AFSCME Local 189, which represents about 1,200 city employees. But I want to be clear that today I'm here as a member of the Portland Utility Board and speaking on that behalf. Uh, I really want to thank the BES team. They presented to the board numerous times and responded to several rounds of questions in between the, the many board meetings we had uh, regarding the development of this budget. Affordability is always one of the key things that we discuss, that we're, that we're engaged in, and with the 3% the this year, and consistent with the five-year forecast, uh, they've, met, they've met the challenges. They've met what the commissioner and what the, what the council directions have been in, in coming in on this budget. One of the items of concern is with rates of inflation and, and rates of these increases not necessarily aligning, we feel like it's also incumbent on you to provide some additional communication as well as perhaps political cover as they try to do what they've been instructed to do in developing the sustainability of these systems. Um, we really did engage a lot along the uh, low income discount and the multifamily, and that has been a significant change. That was a, a significant uh, nut to crack in, in being able to help those in multifamily housing to experience some of those uh, benefits or some of that relief from the increasing rates. Uh, staffing is something that we, we continually look at as well, and they have been able to add in staffing, filling vacancies that had been open for some time. Uh, we continue to be aware of the long-term costs of the, of the increased staffing and, and just want to make sure that those stay in line. Performance metrics is another one. Performance metrics was one of those that with the change to this new budgeting system uh, were, were challenging for a lot of bureaus and in how to figure out what is the right metric, what is measurable in how they deliver these budgets in, 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 a, in, in, the, in the new format. We've worked very closely with BES in, in developing their strategic plan. We've participated in that from, from start to finish, and as well as their equity plan, and we really are committed to helping develop those metrics. In closing, we want to recognize the significant challenges that change management brings. There's also a lot of opportunities, and I feel like Mike Jordan and his team have really embodied that to take advantage of these opportunities, and we appreciate the progress that they've made in both the developing the strategic plan as well as improving and streamlining the service delivery as well as the CIP program as a whole. Thanks for your time and we will continue to stay plugged in and our, our official letter will be in, in the next month. Thank you. Yes, Thompson, um, as I mentioned, um, I might need to turn it over. Sorry about that. Janice Thompson, Oregon Cub. So as I mentioned before, a good chunk of this um, is applies to both bureaus, so you've already seen it. So on page four, there's a few uh, comments. 
where it is actually isn't so much that we have disagreements with the CBO analysis, but just are highlighting some areas where it seems like um, some additional emphasis could have been helpful. Um, I don't think they're minor, but they're nuanced enough that I'll let you read them and say no more. Very good, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, uh, the Bureau of Transportation is uh, next up. Commissioner U. Daly, if there are any words of introduction you would like to say. Um, we've had a request for a brief break. Why don't we take a five minute recess? Absolutely. Thank you. So re-adjourn, or re come back please at 11.20.
Welcome back, everybody. We're going to keep pushing on just because I, I know transportation is a great subject. Thankfully, we're not buried in three inches of ice today. That would have made it even longer. Um, exactly. In order to uh, accommodate our schedule, what we're going to do is take the Office of Community Technology out of today's lineup and move it into the session, which is scheduled for April 1st. And we're going to move it into the 11:30 time slot. Is that? Am I reading that correctly? And that way, we won't be as time pressured. I, I want to make sure that we give transportation the time it certainly deserves, as well as legal counsel. Commissioner Daly. Thank you, Mayor. Colleagues, uh, a budget is a financial statement, but it's more than that. It's most fundamental, fundamentally a statement of priorities. The budget tells the public where we intend to commit our limited resources and thus what we value. My priorities for our transportation system are safety, equity, and sustainability. I want us to build a transportation system that keeps Portlanders safe as they get from place to place. I want us to build a system that focuses on the transportation needs of our most vulnerable community members. And finally, I want us to build a system that helps us address both, both local air pollution and the global crisis of climate change. The good news is that these three priorities are all interrelated and we really can't advance on one without improving the others. So um, just want to give you a little good news before we talk about the budget. This budget uh, does make progress on three, all three of these priorities. It invests in safety, it bolsters the Bureau's equity initiatives, and it supports programs and policies that get solo drivers out of their cars and into more sustainable options. I'd now like to welcome Interim Director Chris Warner to tell us how the Portland Bureau of Transportation is helping move Portland into a safer, more equitable, and greener future, as well Great. as review our budget. Welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Mayor, uh, Council Members, Chris Warner, Interim Director. Um, we've got lots of PBOT people in the audience, but I'd like to identify uh, the folks that are here at the table with me. Jeremy Patton, who's our Business Services. Uh, director, he's uh, going to be running the slideshow today. I know assets have come up, so I had Emily Trich, who is our asset manager, be here. And I know uh, with the equity questions that have come up, I've had uh, I've asked Cheers. Irene Marion to get her steps in and come up now um, to talk about uh, some of the equity questions that that may come up in terms of our budget presentation. So uh, let's go to slide two. So uh, this slide this provides an overall uh, overview of our base budget. I think the key distinction here, as you can see, it's $565 million a year, uh, is about 60% of our ongoing funding comes with strings attached. So as you can see uh, on the top part is where it says discretionary, and then on the bottom uh, it is kind of the, um, the restricted uh, funds that we, can, that we can spend. So uh, much of the discretionary resources are allocated to operations and maintenance of our transportation system, and only about $11 million uh, is is coming to uh, infrastructure improvements in, as part of our discretionary. The bulk of our funding, 95% of our infrastructure improvements are within the uh, specific uh, categories that are voter approval or restricted by grants. So we're very restricted on in terms of how we, we spend those dollars. So uh, as part of the overall program structure, uh, we are, we've divided ourselves into seven different categories. Uh, as you can see, the largest in terms of number of employees is operation maintenance, which is almost half of our uh, of our crew, 439 folks. They are the people that do work on the environmental systems, the street lights, uh, street signs, and the sidewalks and bridges. Uh, so, uh, and the second biggest group there is um, is the support services, which includes all of the back office, the HR, the equity, the communications, all the rest of that, and our, and our financial services piece. Uh, next slide. Um, we have a, a wide variety of assets at PBOT, um, so this picture really tries to represent all of the different assets we have. It's every, anything from an aerial tram, we have a heliport, we have a dock, along with the 4,700 lane miles of, uh, of street, we have the streetcar. Uh, one thing that's not on there that is uh, one thing that we think about a lot, we, have, we actually have four tunnels. Uh, most of them are over 75 years old, and those are uh, assets that are really in need of, of, uh, of, of taking a look at uh, just because of their age and the condition. So uh, what I wanted to do, we did a recent uh, survey and asked Portlanders their, their top transportation concerns, and three issues really led the pack. 
and those are safety, congestion, and road maintenance. So we are completing what we're calling our moving to the future, our strategic plan for 1922 that will really guide our work for the next three years. And so in order to reflect the concerns that Portlanders had for us, uh, here are kind of the three uh, major buckets of work that we're looking at as part of our strategic vision moving forward. Working for a safe and accessible Portland, building, preserving, and repairing Portland streets, and then creating solutions for our growing city. By delivering on these three goals, we really can save lives by protecting Portlanders who walk, drive, roll, however they get around the city. We can save time by easing congestion, by looking at different tools in terms of how we use the right of way. And we can also save money by maintaining our roads more efficiently and effectively, particularly treatments that can take us into the future. We've also invested a lot of time uh, on how, on these goals, and in terms of looking at our performance measures. Although we are still re, uh, really defining our, our performance measures, in the 1819 budget we had about 10 performance measures. We've really upped our game and we're looking at having about 68 in the next budget wow. in terms of trying to figure out how we uh, actually spend the, 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 the people's money. I think it's been a really good exercise for us as we've gone through our strategic planning process to figure out what is measurable and what really uh, does create the outcomes that we really want to see. Could I ask you a quick question Absolutely. on that, Chris? And, yeah. and just a reminder, we pulled one of our budget hearings out, so I, I think we're, we're good time-wise. When you say 68 performance measures, I assume those are clustered mm -hmm. under broader goals. Is that correct? Um, yes. Or do you have a sense yeah. of that yet? Yeah, no, they, they are. Um, I'll have Jeremy, you want to? Yeah, so they're, they're clustered under the three goals, and they're also clustered within our seven programs, so we Fabulous. assign them to all okay. of them. They are so what I was related, about. So. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so our first strategic goal, working for a safe and accessible Portland. In 2015, as you know, Portland became a vision zero city. We're one of the first cities in the country to do this. Uh, we really are focused on trying to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. Uh, and so we've uh, worked up what we have our kind of the strategic goals for, for doing that. Uh, the first is really strengthen a culture of street safety within PBOT and across the city. That's all part of the, uh, the effort where we've been trying to communicate that outwards. We want to protect the most vulnerable users on our streets regardless of how they get around. Certainly design and install uh, safe infrastructure where it's needed most. Identify safe speeds while we're using education, enforcement, and engineering to achieve those because as we know, speed is the is really the number one factor in terms of survivability of some of these uh, traffic crashes. And we're also going to test uh, emergent technologies, such as different uh, protected bikeway infrastructure and launch safety initiatives, such as our Safe Ride Home, which is one way we're trying to work on uh, trying to get people to, uh, to uh, um, drive drunk less. In, in Drunk less, I guess, is not the right word. But uh, we're actually going to be doing that again on, um, on St. Patrick's Day. So uh, we will be offering uh, vouchers for people to take taxi cabs and, and Ubers and Lyfts to get home. So uh, we really are seeing progress uh, from what's going on. Um, but our early vision work on Vision Zero, we, we've really discovered there's much more to do. So in our strategic plan, we are taking two major steps to achieve safe streets for all. First, we are continuing our aggressive implementation of our Vision Zero action plan. We're really focusing on what we call uh, the the high crash network, which is the, the streets that, um, where they have the most speed and have the, 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 they're usually the wider streets, they're usually mostly in East Portland, and it's, uh, it's where we really see all of the, many of the traffic fatalities. Uh, for this reason, the second major step is to uh, broaden our safety initiatives and build that into everything we do by building safer streets, safer sidewalks, uh, bike infrastructure, and lighting is another huge component, and I think I'm going to talk about that now. So in this year's budget, uh, our general fund request really has a dual approach. The first, we are looking for money to improve street lighting on the most dangerous stretches of road. With better lighting, we can make it safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. Those are really two of the most vulnerable groups in our streets. And this map, as you can see, um, this slide indicates the high crash network. Uh, the high crash network is, is there. The green are parts of the high crash network that have uh, lighting on both sides while the orange, it, do you have that in your packet? Uh, Chris, I think that this might be a new slide. The, the packet this is, is from um, what you provided to our office last Thursday, what they have. That's not in there? Oh, okay. 
Uh, well, um, there's a, a, a slide that you can see up there um, that uh, mostly the, the oranges are streets uh, out in East Portland, uh, 122nd, that only have lighting on one side. And that's one of the critical components of, of what we really want to do. And so what we, uh, what we ask is, our general fund ask, is we're looking for, for money to light one of those corridors. So why... I know we've only got 1.5 million of cannabis tax money dedicated to Division Zero, but you've got $223 million in discretionary uh, revenue. Why, I mean, that, that is a very high priority. Why, isn't, why is that a general fund ask rather than a priority within your existing funding? Yeah, we have, um, I, I think it's a matter of prioritization. Um, we, uh, we try to balance those those things. I mean, with the cannabis tax money, and we've been very appreciative of that. Um, I think one of the our directions was to come forward with we we thought would be a high priority for, um, for for general fund money, and so that was one of the ones we identified. But but then my question is, why not prioritize from your existing money since you know people are dying and there's only street lights on one side of the street? Yeah, I uh, that's uh, and it, at some point we'll we will have to do that. Um, I think if if we can't get you know any of the the funding for that, but it, it really does put us then I think we have to then go back and figure out what we we, we don't pay for at that point. Yeah, I guess that's what my question is: what will not get done? Because yeah. if if we're so, being asked to prioritize scarce general fund money, I'd like to know compared with what. Sure, we can do and we can do that analysis in terms of what we don't fund. And then uh, the second one was, uh, the second general fund ask that we had was uh, the citywide campaign to encourage common sense traffic safety habits for everyone on our roads. This campaign builds off of the Struck campaign, which was uh, very successful in terms of, of raising the awareness of, of what it is to uh, drive uh, fast in our city. And so we're, we're enthusiastic about this campaign. And we've and what we would like to do is to expand that next year with some additional outreach to many communities that don't, um, that might not have access to that campaign. So it would include outreach to um, communities of color, people of, that are just uh, new immigrants uh, to the community. So we want to really um, do a lot of education dollars. I know that um, before, uh, education dollars hasn't been a high priority for, um, for, for CBO in terms of us using our funds for that. So that's why we're asking for general fund. Okay, the next slide, hopefully you have, uh, is building and preserving and repairing Portland streets. So really to deliver on our mission to uh, support a prosperous city, to get people around uh, safely and sustainably, we really must do what we can to fix our crumbling infrastructure. Um, first, as more and more people move to Portland, they put increased uh, stress on our transportation system, and really the, the, the funding has not kept pace uh, with that. So we've, had, we've been very lucky to get some recent funding increases, whether it's through the state, uh, through fixing our streets or some of the, gate, the state uh, dollars. But that really, um, that hasn't, that's made a dent, but not a big dent in terms of what we need to do. What I'd like to do is, um, I also want to emphasize, we're trying to figure out better ways to use our resources. So uh, we are going through kind of a strategic asset plan in terms of how we make those investments. So, uh, that's something we're really uh, excited about doing. One of the things I know, like with the capital set-aside program, paving did not um, score that well. So what we're trying to do is look at our entire, entire paving portfolio, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, some of the different techniques we're using in order to, um, to make those paving dollars go further and to make sure we're using the dollars the best we can. And then kind of our third strategic goal is what we call managing for growth. And so what we're trying to do is really create solutions for our growing city. Um, and it is a pretty straightforward problem. The more people we get that come here, uh, people recognize, I think we saw this in our survey, that um, the more people that move here, they're, they're, we're not going to be able to build more roads in order to accommodate them. So I think uh, in, our pres in our survey, it said like seven out of 10 Portlanders believe that you just can't build new roads. And so what we need to do is to try to figure out ways to use the right of way faster and to get people around faster and smarter. So uh, kind of the, our three strategies on this is to make smart investments in projects that increase safety and efficiency of our roads. 
Uh, the second is to adopt policies that give people clear incentives to make better and more sustainable transportation choices, whether that's, uh, trans that's bicycle infrastructure, more sidewalks. If people aren't able to walk because of the infrastructure, we need to enable them to do that. And then we also need to develop projects and really launch policies that make more efficient and environmentally friendly options for transit and make transit really more, uh, more affordable to Portland's and actually more accessible. So uh, I, I think you've heard about our enhanced transit uh, strategy where um, a bus uh, stuck in traffic uh, doesn't do anyone any good. We heard that with Central City in Motion where um, some of the delays on buses in downtown, they affect you know, out East Portland because the buses just can't get through. So finding strategies in order to uh, make sure that uh, our traffic, particularly our buses and transit and our high capacity transit move more quickly uh, is something that's really important to us. And so that's one of our, our key goals within our strategy. So um, the two things that we are looking for for um, general fund requests, one is some, ad some additional money for better NATO. Uh, this would be above and beyond the money that we've got in the central city. Better NATO, we found, is going to be a key <coughs> piece of, of the central city in motion plan in terms of the, uh, the north-south connector uh, through, a, through the central city. We've had a very successful pilots going on, so we're looking at making some investments to make that permanent. And the second one, as I mentioned before, is an enhanced transit corridor. So we are looking for some money to study so we can have some really uh, smart, quick investments on enhanced transit, whether it's uh, some additional transit lanes, if it's uh, some additional uh, lighting works to actually make transit move faster and better throughout uh, the central city. So could you respond to this uh, city budget office's um, comment on that, that that's TriMet's job and why is PBOT doing it? Sure. Uh, as the manager of the right-of-way, I mean, it's, it's our responsibility uh, to, uh, to try to make sure that buses um, move faster. I think it, it helps Portlanders. I think it helps the, the region in order for them to move quick, uh, more quickly within you know, the right-of-way. And, and we're doing this in partnership with, with TriMet. We're not going to do this alone. Uh, you know, we can clear a lane, but if TriMet doesn't have the service to provide, then I think that uh, that doesn't do anyone any good. But no, this is a partnership with us and TriMet in terms of, of where they think the best routes would be in order for us to, uh, to, to speed them up. Because yeah, they, they will be partners with us. And would they give us any money? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, yeah, well, uh, we, uh, that's that's a great ask, and I mean, um, we've got the we've got the expertise. Uh, uh, they yes. clearly have an uh, incentive. They want their buses sure. to move faster as well. It <laughs> yeah. would seem like that partnership ought to involve them helping to fund. Yeah, I, uh, I I don't disagree, and that's something we can definitely uh, talk to them about in terms of where they would make the there's kind of the strategic investments in terms of service, or maybe it's maybe it's some signal work that they could do as well. Maybe it's putting uh, some electronics on the buses in order to uh, work better with our city system. I think, I think yeah, this partnership is one that, that we would love to continue. Okay. I, I just have a yeah. quick question. Um, on, excuse me, Better NATO 2.0, mm -hmm. is, um, is this just a summer program then? Uh, it currently uh, is a summer program, though it's happening now because of the, the closure of uh, the East Bank Esplanade. But we would like to make it a permanent uh, solution uh, for for connectivity you, into the downtown. Um, do you have any plans to do um, any kind of a study on whether people will use it? I see it's 3.4 times more likely to ride in the summer season. What about in the winter when it's... Yeah. Do you have any plans to do that before moving forward with just making it a permanent... I think we've, we've looked at it as part of Central City in Motion, um, and uh, I, I think one of the things that we found is that people still do a lot of riding. Um, they do it in the park currently. Uh, so what we're trying to do is get people out of the park. Uh, we're trying to create kind of a pedestrian through zone as well uh, with the better NATO. That way, when there are big festivals in the park, you know, people bleed into right. the street. So, so uh, we think it can be a year-round um, success. And so, um, and and part of the better NATO piece that I think is uh, that is kind of overlooked is also with some additional signal work under the Hawthorne Bridge because that's been kind of a bottleneck in terms of people going over the Hawthorne Bridge and actually having a signal as you're going east over the Hawthorne Bridge. So that's, that's part of the process we're doing with Better NATO. So um, I, I do think that the number of riders are only going to increase. And so um, I think it's important to say this is not just a, a pin right now, but it's a pin for the future in terms of making the, the central city uh, more accessible uh, to, to all sorts of transportation. So you are going to do a pilot? 
on the winter months, or you're just going to yeah, move well, ahead? Our, our goal would be to, um, to do it permanently. Just Sorry. Yeah. no pilot. Just pull off the Band-Aid. Chris, the Central yeah. City in Motion, have you impaneled the advisory group? Has that group been impaneled? Um, I, if not, it's in formation. Is it? It's in formation, in formation. yeah. Okay. It's, at some point, you know, I, I don't know what the time frame is, but that would be an appropriate group to engage Absolutely. in some of this conversation. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple of questions, Chris, yeah, before you sure. move on. Um, so the... Uh, I had a question about the Enhanced Transit Priority Network. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to a project that TriMet is doing with the new lines that are supposedly going to have better buses and fewer stops? Is there some coordination happening? Um, yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, we are working with TriMet. Um, the, 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 the general finance was more um, kind of a planning exercise as opposed to um, the implementation, which <clears throat> well, that was going to be my it. next question. It's like, are you implementing it before you actually do a plan for what you're going to do? <laughs> yeah, that, that's why we're planning. That's why we're asking for the planning money first. So, uh, And then I had a question about the, uh, the local improvement districts. Mm -hmm. um, are we creating inequitable communities, communities that can afford to pay for better tr infrastructure, get better infrastructure because they charge themselves a bit more? And has there been any evaluations about who's harmed by creating these enhanced uh, local improvement districts? Uh, I'm not sure in terms of what, what do you mean by harmed? You well, mean in I terms mean, of the people that are charged? I mean, you know, we, the, uh, the Constitution says we all have equal access to uh, all that government has to offer, mm -hmm. and then we allow businesses to pay a little bit more and get a little bit more. And so I, I'm just wondering if anybody's done an analysis about are we creating two systems of uh, accountability, right, based on who can afford to pay for it and who can't? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, uh, I, I can ask our, uh, our LID in, um, administrator that. Uh, certainly, we don't use LIDs that often. It's a tool that we usually use when there's a consensus. And, um, and so we're, we're trying, we'll, try, we'll try to figure that out. But I, I don't know of. of um, I mean, we did the best job, I think, uh, with the last local improvement district that we did in Central East Side. But it wasn't lost on me that we have one that operates in Lloyd District, we've had one that's operated downtown. You know, for at least a decade and a half. Yeah, I think that might be a business improvement district. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd just like to point out that LADs are often an opportunity to leverage private dollars. We are not, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, for better or for worse, property adjacent property owners are responsible for sidewalks, for instance. Yeah. And uh, these are often happening in areas with a lack of pedestrian infrastructure, including sidewalks. So we're using them as opportunities to do work that needs to be done that we would be paying for anyway, while in concert with the private property owners who are then paying for their part of it. Yeah. Is that an accurate description? Yeah, and, and I think what we've tried to do in some areas, we've tried to use some of our funds to buy down some of those LIDs, and particularly in areas where there's where the incomes aren't as high, in terms of making sure that we can do that, so the so the individual homeowners, for instance, don't pay that much. Um, but we, so we buy down on in terms of what the local improvement district does. In, in some of the bigger LIDs, like there was an LID, um, I think that was council imposed with the streetcar in terms of paying for um, part of the streetcar on the, on the, on the east side. Um, so, so that was one, but that, was, that went through a, a petition process, so it was a very, it was a very large and extensive uh, public process on that one. I, Thank you, Chris. I think that's been clarified for me. Okay. I, I'd like yeah. to tag on to that, because that was some of my questions, because sure. I'm discussing with a private developer an LID out in Gateway right now, but coming to city council tomorrow. Um, are we using them enough? As a property owner out there and helping with the street plan for Gateway, I thought they were a great idea to share the cost to get more done than what's been done out there. But also, 
it should be in conjunction, not just with PBOT, which I appreciate their sharing their SDCs on that, but other, if it's in an urban renewal, an urban renewal area, or wherever the funds can be mm -hmm. to share so those property owners don't have such a heavy burden and stuff, and especially if they are bringing a community benefit to the area when they're doing their development. So I know some, pro they may, in my opinion, they should be used more. I know okay. some business owners who wanted to expand. Your charges were so much, and what they had to do with the street, they bagged the expansion, therefore they won't be hiring more people, mm -hmm. et cetera. So we have to have a long-term look and maybe encourage, explain the process to property owners. Because I personally said when they wanted to redo Pine, 99th and Pine, where my property is, I'd happily go into that LID because the cost would be potentially so much less, but such an improvement. So I think it's a lack of understanding of the program that could be used actually more often in some areas, especially where there's businesses as well as developers building. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I would just add, um, we've also been working with BES a lot in terms of, of kind of combining with them and working on LIDs. So it's been a, a great partnership we've had with them in terms of being able to buy down some of the costs uh, for, for individual uh, homeowners. Um, so I think uh, the next slide I would like to talk a little bit about the equity of our work. So we are in the process of, of, institu of institutionalizing equity in everything we do. Our efforts are guided by our, our Bureau's five-year racial equity action plan, and it focuses on the following initiatives. First is developing a transportation equity uh, framework that, uh, future, that furthers equity initiatives and policies, and, including investments. We're transforming the relationship with underserved communities that have uh, the PBOT has with uh, with people and, and how we deal with the right of way. We contribute to the resilience of communities that are the most vulnerable in the midst of growth and challenge. We're increasing opportunity for the historically underserved communities to meaningfully engage. And we're also really trying to strengthen uh, staff capacity in terms of doing kind of the outreach and making sure we implement the equity framework. So some of the notable uh, progress things we've had over the past year, uh, we've, uh, we've been engaging with the African American community in terms of how to ensure the Lloyd to Woodlawn neighborhood greenway reflects their transportation priorities. We have achieved, uh, we've been very successful in our DMW ESB utilization rate. We're at about 68% on our Fix Our Streets projects, which is uh, well past the 30% of what we'd hoped for. And, uh, and we're also trying to work through the Creek Settlement, which is where we're investing millions of dollars uh, into uh, curb ramps in order to uh, make it easier for people to get in and around the city. And also for the first time, uh, I've asked that we invest $250,000 within the equity program within the director's office so we can uh, increase things like trans translation materials, expand community partnerships, and then offer a more robust equity-focused training for staff. So those are some of the things we've done in the last year. Yeah. It's a little bit more general, mm -hmm. um, so help me out here. Sure. Um, over the years, I we all been witnessing a lot of improvement in our roads for bicyclers, or cyclers, cyclers. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been doing those improvements while we still have uh, traffic intersections and sidewalks that are really deadly in our community. So how come we are still prioritizing the add-on that's still needed while we don't have some of our basic needs? Satisfying. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, what, what we are trying to do is to do it um, basically on a quarter by quarter basis. We're doing a lot of work on outer division. Uh, we've got recently got state money for like outer Powell. And so some of the big and more dangerous streets on our high crash network, we are really trying to figure out ways to make those investments. So um, sometimes when you, when you do work, you're required by, by state law to, to add bicycle facilities okay. on some. So I, I don't know if that's the case in all of them. But I know that on some roads, when you do make improvements, you have to add those bicycle facilities. But even though if it's just paint on the ground, those still probably aren't safe. So we're still trying to look for um, better ways to, to do and what's the budget allocated for bicycle, bicycle lanes improvements and so, so on? Um, we don't split out that specific budget just for bike lanes. It's usually by project, so the project's going to include all the paving, the bicycle facilities, signal work, paint. et cetera. So yeah. it's, it's all kind of lumped in together. We don't track them separately, typically by project. 
Um, it would take a lot of work to kind of go back and look at all of those specific No worries. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have another question, yeah. and this is a little bit more general, and it's for uh, the council as well as the mayor. So last time we were talking a little bit about transportation, it came up that a lot of the sidewalks are not built because it's up to the homeowner to build the sidewalk. And the question is, the, the pedestrian is our responsibility, not the homeowner. Why do we continue leaving that up to the homeowner if we know the homeowner cannot afford it or it's not their priority? Uh, when are we going to take on that? Meaning, us to see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Certainly, um, you know, installing sidewalks is is particularly in in many places in the city would be a very expensive. Um, uh, proposition, and I, I just don't think we have the funding. I think one of the tools we've talked about with LIDs, in terms of doing that, uh, with the uh, the Eltic program, we've tried to uh, um, emphasize putting sidewalks on on streets that have more traffic. In terms of instead of having uh, basically floating sidewalks on side streets, uh, that was part of the the genesis of of making the, if you had to build a house and you had to put a sidewalk, we didn't want it on a street where there were no other sidewalks. So what we've done is try to take that money and put it into streets that actually had more pedestrian traffic in order to make it safer for folks. But yeah, that's something that we've not really been able to solve in terms of how do we make um, all of those uh, transportation uh, improvements. It's so it's just not really, really because it's up to the owner, it's because it's expensive. I, yeah, I don't think we have the funding to do it. Uh, I mean, I can speak to that. Um... On the next slide, you're going to see our maintenance backlog of $3.25 billion. So uh, taking on, we could say we're going to take on building sidewalks. Um, yeah. But we have an obligation and a desperate need to catch up with the existing backlog. So, I mean, it's too bad that we made this decision sometime in the past. Um, one of the challenges with East Portland is that before it was annexed by the city, it was unincorporated Multnomah County. Multnomah County allowed developers to build without creating sidewalks. Um, and so now we're struggling to, to address that challenge. Um, my office is looking at how we maintain that asset once it exists, because it's hard enough to build the sidewalk, but then we know that many um, property owners can't afford to maintain it, and we don't think that that is necessarily the best way to manage such a valuable and important public asset. But um, I mean, the simplest answer is we just do not have the money to build miles and miles of sidewalks. Um, and, and we have made some. I mean, um, uh, I think by with the council, we have made some investments on some sidewalks, I think on some of the busier streets. And you know, as, as you can see in our budget, a lot of times we are de we you know depend on the kindness of strangers, if you will. Um, but like the legislature got a bunch of money um, a few years ago for, to put sidewalks on 136 because that's a very busy street that really needed sidewalks. There were a lot of uh, uh, problems there, so I, I think the legislature gave us some money and we were able to execute sidewalks on 136. So we look to make those strategic investments, uh, particularly on the places where um, the, they're the most dangerous in terms of of, um, of traffic volume. So. But the reality is, is that when the city annexed all uh, East Portland and parts of Southwest, they made a commitment to those communities that those communities still remember uh, that was never kept, right? And so while it's, I don't, I, I I don't think we can blame the county for it. It was, and it was something the city said that it was going to do. And so there are parts of Southwest Portland that has as poor a sidewalk and infrastructure as East Portland. Um, and so it, I, I still believe it's a commitment that the city failed to deliver on. And so we have to mitigate that by doing other improvements. I will say that there's $28 million that's scheduled for transportation infrastructure improvement in East Portland over the next couple of years. That's going to go a long way towards uh, helping us create some 
I hate this word now, equity. <laughs> um, uh, but it's gonna help us actually keep that promise uh, that was made over 30 years ago. Um, is it gonna make East Portland and Southwest Portland whole? No, uh, but it's gonna go a long way towards actually uh, the city being able to, uh, to, again, keep some of those promises that were made a long time ago. And I, I still like the word equity because I think it, we're finally starting to talk about what does that really mean. Yeah, because right, everybody has a different definition. Of that. <laughs> I mean, just in these budget the conversations along, the word equity has just been very fascinating how it's being used. Well, particularly since it wasn't uh, eight years ago. Uh, before we move on from this topic, I'd like to give Dr. Smith and perhaps Irene Marion, our ex the excellent uh, equity manager from the Bureau of Transportation, a chance to comment before we go on to the rest of the presentation. Could I have a couple questions just on sidewalks? Before we get sure. off the issue of sidewalks, yeah. number one, with my discussions out in East Portland and East Portland Action Plan, mm -hmm. letting the developers off the hook by putting in some money, we'd prefer to have the floating sidewalks because eventually you infill them and then we end up with a complete sidewalk without, and the developers aren't off the hook on developing uh, when they do that. There's, too, there's been too much of it out in East Portland. And that's why we don't have sidewalks. Um, I did also um, want to say that I appreciate the flashing beakers you've put out there for safety. <laughs> There's several things you're doing with lowing as an East Portland resident who is driving those streets all the time as well as walking them. So I see that where it needs to be infilled. But um, it <laughs> you... Um, the efforts you've made to lower the speeds, I know the commuters hate it, but as a resident of that area, I love it. And I have to just catch it because 136 just switched from 30 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour <laughs> and stuff. All right, and, be careful. And while I want, this is a technical question because 136 was supposed to have improvements in 2019. Do you consider that the fiscal year 2019 or the calendar year? I get a lot of questions. It might Why be the hasn't construction it years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get a lot of questions. Well, when it's going to happen? And since I drive it every single week, yeah. I know it definitely needs to be done. So I can't answer that question to the people out there in David Douglas. When is that road going to be fixed? It's on the schedule. But when? I, can, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can get you. We make sure we get you that information. Okay, that'd be great because then I could share it okay. with those yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Soon they're going to be asking when are we going to stop fixing these roads <laughs> because <laughs> Portland is about to see uh, more work on the roads than possibly ever. So I would like some kind of briefing on whatever promises were made to Southwest and East County. Um, my understanding of East County was it centered more around the sewer system, but I would like to be yeah, I, on that. I can. And As a resident okay. for 42 years out there mm -hmm. and listen to all the conversations, the conversations, if we annexed and voted to annex, they would help with the sewer system, but also fix the streets and add the sidewalks. It was all part of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, it was all part of the conversation. And let me tell you, I agree with Joanne. They have long memories out there. And they're going to let you know every well, chance they get. I'd like to get. see what's in writing. <laughs> okay. um, and let's, so let's keep moving. Oh. And I was going to let Irene up can highlight some things as well, but I want to give her some time to make sure since she's part of. Good morning. Um, I think the most exciting body of work that we're about to pursue is the development of an equity transportation framework. Um, to the comments earlier, you know, equity can be very broad, um, but I think as we are building out the equity work for PBOT, we really want to get clear about how does equity apply to our transportation system? What would an equitable transportation system look like? And is Portland meeting the mark? So we'll be going through an internal process and an external process to really answer those questions, hone in, so that hopefully by the time you see us next budget season, we are really more clear about performance measures, data sets, how we're engaging community, where we're showing up, where we're investing our funds based on that framework. So that's something I want to put on your radar. Another exciting thing um, that I will say is really 
reflective of the new budget process is it was really great for me to be able to go in and really see how our teams program by program articulate you know how they define equity and how they think they're showing up for our equity work but it was really awesome to see that we have so many teams uh, so many programs really across our bureau that are really doing disability focused work we have over 10 programs or initiatives across our bureau that are doing everything from ramps um, addressing other issues in the right-of-way engaging with disability communities, our Bike Town for All program, et cetera. So we'll be working towards more um, internal coordination to strengthen those efforts and build more and deeper relationship into those communities. Um, another emphasis that you'll see us have in the upcoming year is really a focus on deepening our relationship and community. So our, uh, Chris mentioned that we have a number of projects right now where we have been trying to just pause and have hard conversations, engage new partners, and really respond to the concerns, the new concerns that sometimes um, are in direct opposition to policy frameworks that we've already established, but really to have the hard conversations around how do we include new voices, how do we have deeper, stronger relationships into communities so that as we do our equity work moving forward, that we're coming from a different perspective, that we're informed by new voices in our process and that we're responding to their needs and encouraging them to take advantage of all the transportation options that they have. Um, something else that's coming forward to council later this year, uh, we are in the process, just open public comment for our pedestrian master planning process. Within that, we actually did a uh, series of focus groups called Walking While Black, and that was an opportunity for us to go into the black community, um, both African American and black uh, African immigrant populations and really understand how is their experience in our transportation system different? How do our pedestrian investments need to respond um, to the concerns that we're hearing? How do we reframe our definitions of safety to address personal safety, um, hate crimes and other things that are really informing the choices that people are making on a daily basis in our system? So those are examples of the types of work that we are pursuing um, and I'm happy to answer any questions around those. I'll just quickly add, um, so the lighting request was one of the things that sort of rose to the top um, and what that looks like particularly for um, outer Stark Street, right, and um, communities that, uh, you know, high concentration of communities of color um, and immigrant populations, and so that is a safety concern. And the other highlight was just around um, adaptive, bike town, adaptive bike town, which I think um, uh, is something that you know is encouraging as we're you know continuing to um, think about um, communities with disabilities and the other piece and Irene just mentioned this at the end of what you commented on and I thought about the slide that you had up previously around um, developing projects and launching policies that you know are friendly and make you know transportation uh, public transit more attractive um, and affordable and the safety piece I think is one that can't be lost there uh, and uh, particularly for communities of color in light of recent events and so we have to really be cognizant of how that impacts the decisions that communities of color make um, in their transportation. Regarding equity and this, I'm going to go back to you with I'm assuming PBOT does a lot of contracts. We do. So, it's a lot of work and uh, often it's the bigger firms who get it and they sub out themselves how do, I used to do federal contracts for a company so I know how kind of some of these yeah. bid proposal works subs are often the ones that are provide the equity people of color women etc but even though they're in the proposal they're never used it's a game they play quite often, the bigger contractors. How do you go about making sure that uh, the people of color, the women, et cetera, are actually doing some work within the contract and it's not just governed by that big contractor and very little of that is be really funneling down to those smaller entities. Yeah, I, um, I, I believe uh, we can talk about it, but we've been doing a really good job in terms of a lot of our contracts really aren't that big. Um, and so, uh, for instance, there have been projects that uh, we've been working to the prime, prime contractor program where we've been getting people from there. I think, um, uh, was it? 50th, we had a 100% utilization rate was, uh, right, uh, who was it? Um, 
Raymore Construction. Raymore, yeah, Raymore Construction. They did the they did an entire project. Uh, we've also worked at 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 uh, raising the limits for some of those smaller contractors and sort of saying you can bid on a $500,000 project when they've been doing things for TriMet for a bunch more. We've actually raised the limit so we can get them being the prime contractors for a lot of contracts. So um, we can talk about the numbers, but I, we're feeling really good about our numbers. If I can add one more thing. So last budget season, we actually requested a new position um, to our organization. We have a DMW ESB coordinator that started with us in the fall. So I don't know how many other bureaus across the city have a position like that. But for us internally, because we're contracting out so much work, we wanted someone in-house that could monitor that, help make sure that we have the right tools and resources, are working in partnership with city procurement, but also assessing the availability of those contractors, what type of their work that they do, and what type of, or how we can help grow their businesses into the nature of the work that we have to offer. Um, so because we have that new position, she's coming online. She's doing a really fabulous job of getting a handle on all of this for us. So um, we're excited to see that. I also want to say that we do have a number of prime contractors from the DMW ESB community that are doing work, work with us. So we're not just relying on our Oops. aspirational goals at the subcontractor level. We are seeing a lot of big improvements on the prime contractors as well. Thank you. I have one more question. Now, Chris, um, one of the things that I appreciate is that uh, because of our regional partners that we work with, uh, that we have the ability to really influence behavior of governments that we are not a part of. So, for example, uh, TriMet, uh, which is supposedly coming out with uh, green, clean buses and um, high-speed buses, uh, there's an opportunity for us to, uh, when we partner, when we put our hard-earned dollars down, that we can actually get leverage those dollars. So, for example, I talk about the butt cheek lanes that we have in East Portland when you're waiting for the bus as compared to the pretty bus shelters uh -huh. that... Uh, folks in inner northeast have now, even though there's nobody on the bus stop. Um, but there's an inequity that's kind of just built into some of our government structures that if you don't call it out, it never gets addressed. So as PDOT continues to build these relationships, I would certainly hope that you would be our biggest advocate for if we're putting a dollar into a TriMet project that we are actually looking at, how does that play out through that system? Because when I look at those steel grates that we can lean up against with no cover, right, and I see all these brand new beautiful bus shelters downtown and in northeast, I, there's, a, there's an equity issue there that is not being addressed. And, you know, when I asked TriMet, so who decided? Who got the shelter versus the lean up against? Uh, and they couldn't answer that. So I hope we use our dollars as the city of Portland to really leverage making sure that we don't allow partnerships that treat one part of the city different than the other. Thank you. We'll follow up. And uh, since I'm, I'll, I'll quicken my pace. Um, so uh, this slide, just ta talking about supporting our city, uh, we've uh, really been working hard in terms of supporting citywide initiatives for the most vulnerable Portlanders. Over the past few years, we have uh, been spending money on the derelict RV program and the homeless camp cleanup. So. Yearly, we spend about $1.7 million in terms of that program. So just to identify that as something that's very needed for the city, we, we are fine in participating, but it really isn't part of our co core service. I just wanted to identify that. So uh, I think this was previewed in terms of our key challenges, um, building and preserving and repairing Portland streets. Uh, we face about a $3.25 billion maintenance need over the next 10 years some of which is funded, but most of it it's not. Uh, on, and people really know this. On their daily trips around the city, they see the potholes, they see the infrastructure that's falling apart. So we are really trying to address that as best we can. So as I mentioned, uh, we talked about some new asset management tools we're using. So uh, by 2020, we got some money from the state, and we're actually going to be adding two new pavement treatments to the process we use. Uh, they're called slurry seal and microservicing. And basically what those do, uh, instead of having to do the, the rebuilds in the future, it actually extends the life of the pavement and over the long term really uh, does uh, save money but also saves pavement and, and allows us to um, invest our money wisely. And um, the other thing we're trying to do, we're looking at kind of an equity tool um, as far as our pavement work. So 
uh, when we're making those improvements, we're also trying to, to do them in places that um, look at risk and also equity. So uh, the, we talk about we repair streets that need it the most, but also in the, neighbors, in the neighborhoods that have the most need. So what we're trying to do is try to balance that. And so if there are uh, kind of two paving projects, we use kind of a, an equity analysis in order to, to make those investments there. Uh, and then I talked about the, the, the capital set aside has been a, a, a great tool for us in terms of trying to make progress in terms of our, uh, in terms of our maintenance backlog. Uh, our highest ranked projects this year were ADA ramps, signal lamp replacement, uh, and some other signal work, plus also the Cornell Tunnel, which, uh, as I said, 75-year-old tunnels need a lot of work. So there's some lining work that's, that I think is uh, over $2 million. That is, I have one minute. Okay. Um, so uh, the key challenges, and I, I want to touch on this. Uh, uh, you know, we are we are um, in terms of of our our budget. We are we feel good where we are at this moment, but I really think it's incumbent on us to talk about some of the challenges we have in the future. So a, as you look at this slide, um, we are trying to uh, achieve the various goals by striking a balance by maintaining our existing system, but also add new elements to it. So these elements are necessary for safety, for other improvements, but they really do um, take a strain on our budget and in, and in the future, uh, it really uh, it's challenging for us. So as you can see, we are fine through year five, but in year six, you can see we start to, um, we start to go into, into the red. Part of that uh, is that uh, this is a really a structural problem we have. Uh, as as the, the money came in from the House Bill 2017, that's going to flatten out. Uh, we look at, at gas tax revenues in the future are going to start to decline. So we really need to have a discussion with council and over the next few years in terms of how we get on a more sustainable path, uh, whether it's uh, other revenue increases or whether it's um, you know different cuts to services. Chris, could I ask you a question yeah. uh, related to that? So I know that Metro uh, has been reported to be having conversations about regional transportation infrastructure and how to address uh, the regional disparities around uh, fund balance. Mm -hmm. are, are you part of that conversation? We are. I think um, Commissioner Daly sits on, on, on the, the Metro 2020 committee that's working at that. So what, one of the things that I think it's, I, I probably need to identify is a lot of these, these programs are, are like projects, right? They, they, uh, because on, on ballot measures, projects are kind of what sell. But we need also just kind of the basic maintenance money and how do we figure out on how to have just to kind of keep the lights on money. That's what we're trying to figure out. How do we do that in terms of was Fix Our Streets was a great investment, but it was also a list of projects that, we de that we're delivering on. But in terms of just the overall budget of the Bureau, that's the one thing we're working on for the future. So does this chart um, reflect the Fix Our Street money going away unless it gets renewed next year? This chart excludes the fixing our streets yeah, money because it. that's specified for specific projects. This is just the general transportation revenue that we can spend on anything. So we keep the fixing our streets separate. Yeah, because it is project related. And when does the fix our street uh, surcharge on the gas tax stop if it's not renewed? 2020. It was a four year gas tax. When in, when in 2020? Um, probably, uh, uh, probably January or maybe yeah, it was four years and it was passed in May of 2016, so presumably um, December, December. December of 26, uh, 2020, December of 2020. So we've got two options for renewing it with the voters? Yes, I think that's a discussion that um, Commissioner Udaley is leading. So I'm curious, what's, how are we moving towards this green future? How, what is PDOT doing to actually envision us looking differently than we look today? Uh, well, the next slide. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, we talk a little bit about the successes question. we've had, whether it's Central City in Motion, um, Sunday Parkways, uh, the scooter pilot. Uh, uh, I really want to shout out to our maintenance and, and operations people who uh, spent a lot of time in February with all these snowstorms just uh, working 12-hour shifts overnight, so it's been hard. But, you know, we, we are looking towards the future, whether it's AVs or different ways of funding the transportation system. We are part of those conversations that are happening both here and in Salem and nationally to try to get to a, uh, some kind of a infrastructure um, 
set that works for us and making sure that, that we know that we're gonna have to move away from single occupancy vehicles, uh, whether it's transit, whether it's other modes of transportation, whether it's compact development, there's all sorts of things that, that PBOT is in the middle of that we wanna continue to work uh, with council and with our colleagues around the region in terms of trying to make sure that uh, we do have a sustainable uh, and uh, mobility system that works for us. I hate to cut into this great conversation, but <laughs> she kept uh, we are time, cutting time. into the attorney's office time, so okay. I do want to and allow enough time. I would like, uh, we just have our, um, our budget advisory committee needs to say a couple of words. So I think Josh, uh, Josh and um, Rob and, uh, and Thomas are here. Th thank you for your time. Good morning, uh, commissioners and uh, CAB members, uh, and particular Commissioner Udaly. Uh, the PBOT BAC is a budget advisory and bureau advisory committee. It's composed of about 22 people, uh, community members of some newcomers, uh, new to the city, to people who've lived their whole lives here, and all different types of modes, et cetera. And we've spent over 1,000 hours working with the, the Bureau on uh, various different aspects and uh, just a little bit on this large budget option. So we really want to thank you for the uh, particular, this new performance uh, measures and this whole new budgeting process. And uh, we'll be talking quickly about the changes in that. But we particularly appreciate Commissioner Udaly's directives and the decision packages which the BAC talked about and uh, completely endorse. I personally, particularly am interested in the RV, uh, derelict RV measures that has some impact on our neighborhood. And uh, particularly also Vision in, uh, Zero, which is getting additional enhancements and alternative modes of transportation, which will address some of the climate and green concerns that were just addressed. So uh, Josh, you have some issues with performance measures and what we can suggest they do. Sure. So we, we recognize that this new budget process is a work in progress, as everyone um, has mentioned. Um, but we really appreciate and commend PBOT for putting forward a document that has tremendous detail. Um, we really appreciate that as a committee. There, there are two areas that we want to focus on, two areas of concern just briefly. Um, one involves in equity impact statements that are now a part of every program offer. We feel that these could be more robust, more actionable. They could have more um, performance measures and metrics attached to them so we can really understand better how our investments impact these different equity goals that we have in mind. And I know that um, these issues have been mentioned and PBOT's working on them, so we're hopeful that in future years um, that can be addressed. The second um, more broadly involves the performance measures. We just want to add our voice to the chorus um, uh, to encourage PBOT and Council to think more thoughtfully about me metrics and measures that really talk about outcomes. Um, you know, not simply discussing miles of, you know, linear miles of, of sewer inspected, but really, you know, how do these investments address our larger goals? Um, I think the, these, these improvements in future years about measures can be done in a number of different areas, and we look forward to having that conversation with PBOT in the future. A lot of our conversations had focused on, on the Vision Zero and those enhancements and just what an important program that was with the improvements that it's, it's started to make and, and will continue to make. And we, we wholly support it and really would encourage council to you know, renew and strengthen our, our commitment to that and, and double down on the, the Vision Zero and, and funding that, that initiative. The metrics is something that was widely discussed and the Bureau has been supportive in reaching out to us so that as those metrics are really developed more fully that, that they will have that community board input uh, as, we, as we move forward with those metrics. The final thing that I would mention is the, the pay equity study and we think that, that those impacts are, are really critical to the city's mission as uh, an employer and, and providing services in the city. And the BBAC appreciates that the city has made that commitment to pay equity and uh, its employees who are often and, and mainly citizens of the city as well. So with that, thank you. We appreciate you uh, t listening for our council and we look forward to engaging in the process in the coming months. So I have a question for the Budget Advisory Committee and that is um, on the directives to develop did you look at my, my earlier question as, you know, these packages are put forward as please add these. Did you look at um, prioritizing within the existing budget? 
And what else could have been asked for? What else could have been asked for? Uh, we were just concerned with what actually has been asked for right now. Right, but you, your question was, do you, do we want to fund these programs rather than do we want to fund these as priorities within the ex existing budget? Is that, I'm just trying to understand, because I know that this whole process has been different this time, that sure. it hasn't come from the community. With, without speaking for every member of the committee, I, I think the consensus was these directives pretty directly target values and, and issues that we're concerned about. So in terms of priorities, they, they perfectly fit those. Um, prioritizing them relative to other important things as part of PBOT's other budget, um, that's a, maybe a separate conversation, but we, we strongly support these directives as laid out. Good, so I hate, uh, is it really urgent? Because we're, we're down to 10 minutes for legal. I bet they could answer in 30 seconds. All right, let's hear it. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pressure, you made me think. Time's up. <laughs> That's okay. You'll pay. <laughs> it's okay. I, I'll get it there. Great. Thank you. I'm sure. We do have another member, Lauren uh, uh, Bates, who also joined us. Uh, so just to show you, there's a lot of support for this issue. Thank you all for your participation. Appreciate it. I actually it. remembered what it was. It's Vision Zero. Just want to make sure that your support of Vision Zero is Vision Zero as it is now, which is not enhanced law enforcement, but more notifying speeders about being able to slow down? Yes. Well, the PBOT part is, is a lot of infrastructure. They will discuss the traffic enforcement with uh, police, because that's their piece of it. Say that again? The PBOT part is about infrastructure of right. traffic safety, the um, funding for in traffic enforcement, it goes through uh, Portland Police Bureau. So we'll discuss that when we get to that. So we'll discuss that at the Police Bureau's budget. Mm -hmm. but I know EPAP has played a, a large role in making sure that as that rolled out, it didn't have a negative impact on these Portlanders. Right. And the Mayor and Budget Office have a question for you. I know there's three directives to develop within the City Attorney's uh, presentation. Is it feasible to do that in 10 minutes? Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a little bit of time uh, available towards the end of the session. So, if we feel like we're not adequately able to address the issues that uh, City Attorney Reeve puts in front of us, we can table some of those things and um, have a have further discussion later in the process. If I could, so I'm going to lay down a new directive. Um, this has been great, and today's presentations have been fantastic. And we've had the opportunity to ask a lot of interesting questions, but we have dozens of bureaus, and we need to get through them all during this process. And so I'm going to take control of the agenda and the time frame here on out. And so here's my new directive to bureau directors and to everyone who is involved. We are going to stick to the time frame. Uh, next week, I believe it is all my bureaus except for one, which is Commissioner Fritz's bureau. Um, we will... Is Parks also next week? Yes. I'm sorry, it's this Thursday. I'm sorry, the next session. I said next week, Commissioner, you're, you're correct. I stand corrected. Um, so everybody should plan their presentations and then take 10 minutes out so that there's plenty of time. And then in addition, as Director Kennard said, we do have time at the end of the process if we need to do more. I don't want to end up doing this where we tell our legal counsel they have five minutes to make a presentation. That's not fair to them. Mayor, so should we wait till the end of the presentation to ask our questions? I think that's a good idea, Thank unless you. anybody has any objections to that. I think that'll help us move these, these forward. Often the question is about to be answered. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and do that, Kanishka. Thank you for the suggestion. Oh, okay, good. So why don't you just give us an overview today? This, this okay. won't be the end of your presentation. Okay, uh, I'm Tracy Reeve. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Commissioners, Madam Auditor, members of the Budget Committee, colleagues. Um, so uh, just very, very quickly, <laughs> our, uh, our base budget with constraints is $13.5 million. That is three-tenths of 1% of the city budget. Um, 
we, about 90% of our budget is personnel. Uh, we currently have budgeted 66.6 .6 total FTE. However, I do want to note that that does not include um, four employees currently providing services, ongoing services to the city attorney's office funded with one-time resources. Um, and that's what our decision packages are structured around. Um, uh, in the materials, it lists our mission and our goals. Um, I'm not going to talk about those just because of the short period of time. Um, some of our performance metrics are we have to review every contract for the city uh, by charter um, and code. And that work has more than doubled in the last 10 years. Um, and we have to do it. It's just essential work. It's legally required. Last year, we reviewed 11,432 contracts. Um, and in 08, 09, it was 5,600. Um, we, ha we handled 1,480 uh, litigation cases in 1718. We had almost two times as many new cases in 1718 as we did in 2010. We have metrics for how we determine when a case is favorably resolved. Last year, 97% of our litigation was favorably resolved. We provide almost 400 hours of training to the city in 1718. That metric is actually down. That's a number we'd like to see go up because it is, we think it's cost effective and it is a way we believe to reduce legal risk, but uh, it is something that um, goes down as our need to do core legal services with limited resources goes up. So again, that's a number we would like to see go up, not down. From 1617 and 1718, those two years, we uh, collected $4.8 million in revenue for the city. That's uh, revenue collection has been a particular focus of our office. Um, two of the positions that we asked to fund on an ongoing basis are staff positions that support that revenue collection work. Um, the budget office did recommend funding those, but again, on a one-time basis. That's challenging for us because it's hard to hire and retain good staff when they're in one-time positions. Positions. We believe that we provide very good legal services at a low cost or relatively low cost. Uh, all in, our legal services are provided at $158 an hour. Outside counsel services average $362 an hour. Um, I'm not going to go through this in any detail given the time constraints, but we work hard to uh, perform our legal services in a way that aligns with the city's values. Over the last few years, we've had an increased emphasis on affirmative litigation to support those values. Examples are suing the Trump administration uh, to defend our sanctuary city policies, uh, participating as an amicus curiae in a lot of different areas concerning the federal government, particularly of note the DACA situation. Um, Recently, we are uh, one of the leads in challenging FCC mandates imposed by the Trump administration that would essentially wrest control of our right of way from us in terms of franchise revenue. Um, and, and another area that we have focused on is defending uh, the city's ability to set its own policies and laws against preemption challenges, whether that's federal or state. Uh, one area that that is occurring and that we're currently litigating so far successfully is defending the city's right to impose uh, fire safety sprinkler requirements. Um, and we also do a lot of work in support of achieving the council's policy objectives. Areas include uh, housing policies, housing emergency, livability, houselessness, affirmative civil rights and equity issues, public safety policies and improvements, and revenue measures. Uh, and just of note, we've done a lot of work in the past year on the sharing economy uh, revenue measures, Airbnb, Uber, Lyft, to make sure that uh, we're getting fair revenue from those companies and also that they're meeting their obligations um, to, in terms of safety uh, and other regulations that the city has imposed. We're also working actively with the revenue division to implement the clean energy measure and maximize the revenues to the city in conformance with the voters' intent. We have been working on increased transparency and public involvement. Uh, a large focus has been working with many of you and the mayor's office uh, to streamline the public records system to provide records quicker and at lower cost. We helped the city, and we don't get involved in every public records request, but we helped the city respond to 31,000 public records requests in 2018, including 22,000 requests made to the police bureau. Um, 
that's a lot of work, and uh, we've been working to try to streamline that. We've been working, uh, we train all public records responders throughout the city. We're working to really develop a mindset of only uh, re failing to disclose records where there's a clear, clear uh, legal exemption and policy basis for doing so. Uh, and I'll just mention that one of our decision packages, which the budget office is recommending against, is uh, a position that would be able to do email searches for public records. Uh, so that right now, BTS has to do that. That's very expensive for requesters. In fact, over 50% of requesters who initially seek uh, email searches end up declining to pursue those because of the cost. And we, if we had this position where we did not have to charge because BTS, those fees are not waivable, uh, even if there's a, a waiver request, uh, if we had that position, we could fulfill those public records requests without charging the public for those fees. And so that's one area where we believe we could really increase uh, public accountability and transparency. Um, improved policing, one of our positions that we've asked for is the policy and training position with the police bureau. We believe that's key. Uh, the public is rightfully expecting the police bureau to continue to work on improving services to people experiencing a mental health crisis and to advance procedural uh -huh. justice and racial equity. The main position we have devoted to that is helping the policy team reform their policies and then helping train on those policies and helping to really apply an equity lens as we're working with the Police Bureau on policy development. We've had this position for three years now, I believe. It's been funded every year with one-time money. Uh, the Police Bureau actually asked that in its budget, given uh, pursuant to a direction to develop, that that be funded on an ongoing basis. The Budget Office has recommended that that uh, not be funded, and that would require us to eliminate that position. And again, you know, we're then in the position where we have to do the absolutely core legal services for the Police Bureau where, when we want to be also doing that affirmative equity work uh, that lends on how can we help them improve their policies and then help, how can we help them train to those policies. Contract reviews, um, we have done a lot of work on um, the process improvements on our contract reviews. Our timeliness is going down in this area and we really don't like that. Uh, we used to do 97% of our contract reviews within five days, we're down to 85%. We, and at a time when we have more time, I can tell you all the different process improvements we've been doing, but a key one is that we have a paralegal position now devoted to routine contract reviews so that our attorneys can do the more complex reviews. Uh, that, again, is one-time money. Um, we've asked that that be funded on an ongoing basis, um, and that request has not been recommended. That position will need to be eliminated, and that's just going to further slow down our review time. That's the end of my presentation. <laughs> that was succinct. Very well done. Um, can I ask you a question? With regard to contract review, that is, that is a core competency yes. of your office. And so is that currently in the proposed, the, the budget office proposed or no? That was not included in CBO's funding recommendations. But that is, a, that is I mean, I, I just want to make sure I understand. That strikes me as being a core obligation of your office. Am I wrong? No, it is a core obligation of our office, and we will still do it. We just will do it slower, um, and what we're the trying to do is your do it quicker. standard. Yeah. Okay, I see. And um, with regard to the question of, of public records disclosure, we obviously have a systematic issue here. The, the number of public records requests we're getting through the police bureau is slowing them down, and I heard yesterday that they are just massively backlogged, which makes everybody unhappy. And um, that is slowing you down as well. Is there a systematic approach here? Are you coordinated with the police bureau in this request? Uh, the, I, I would have to get Jennifer Johnston to give more in-depth uh, answer to that. But yes, we are coordinating closely with them and that, um, that position that would allow email searches would... Right, and BTS is coordinated as okay, well. Okay, so because I'd, I'd like, because that's something I'm going to ask the police chief when she is here. I'm going to ask her about comms. I'm going to ask her about public records requests. 
and all of these interface with other bureaus. And so I want to make sure you're all in alignment and you're all in agreement on what the strategies are to move us forward. And, and then maybe the, the budget office might take a different view of it if they sensed it was really a coordinated approach. Yes, and, and we are in alignment with them. I think another, the police bureau is continuing to hire positions uh, and, and get them online and trained, and that as that right, occurs, but the, if will, they just do that and then you don't align your systems, all they're doing is they're moving the choke point into your office or so in it, it BTS, be, really. The, okay, the email. And that's yes, fair. that's yes. correct. And then that, of course, as you just says, puts a larger burden, particularly on the media, to pay more, which is, I think, something we all agree we don't necessarily want to do. Right. So I, I just want to make sure there is a really thoughtful, coordinated approach in this budget process, and you know, we still have time to, to figure that out and right size it. Yes. So I'd really like the, the three bureaus to get together and figure it out. Yes, and we are working very closely. Jennifer Johnston works okay. very closely with both BTS and the police bureau on those records issues. Very good. Yeah, sure, Commissioner Fish. Um, Director Warner, I'm just going <laughs> off the card. Um, uh, uh, Madam City Attorney, do, do, with Judy's departure, do we have a dedicated staff person in your office that is doing training for boards and commissions consistent with council policy? We do. Uh, Tony Garcia is currently doing that work. Okay. And my next question is to the budget office. Um, you, uh, we are normally cautioned against using serial one-time money for an ongoing purpose. Is the reason that you're recommending one time for the revenue generation, re revenue generating paralegal position simply a question of scarcity of resources. Asha Beldubosit with the budget office, and yes, essentially, it's. And, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I'm. I was trying to be quick. So basically, <laughs> we're recommending one-time funds. In the prior year, it was funded with one-time resources due to. Um, um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, less spending in their external materials and services uh, budget, but these services are generating revenue for the city's general fund in excess of what they cost. So with that being said, it, it was kind of... I think also there was another example of some revenue generating positions where we recommended one-time funding because we weren't quite certain of the long-term ROI um, of those positions. I know that there was a backlog uh, that the attorney's office has been very diligent about working through. So at this point, we weren't sure yet if those positions require ongoing funding and will continue to generate that ROA, ROI. However, that, that does not address the hiring issue that Director Reeve alludes to. And finally, Mayor, just an observation for you. We, we're, this, this analysis documents an explosion and the t testimony documents an explosion in public records requests. And last I checked, we hadn't even implemented body cameras. And so if, if we're, uh, the, the, the district attorney came to see me recently and, and laid out an enormous hole in his budget to deal with that. Um, is that gonna come up when we take on the police budget in terms of anticipating over the next few years what our what kind of money we're setting aside for public records requests around body cameras? Yes, and that's, that's actually part of the overall question around body cameras and thus the desire to do a pilot project to help measure what we think it's gonna be. And we've also done evaluations of what it is in other cities. Body cameras, people think of it as, and I know you know this, but I'll, I'll just say this for the edification of the public, people think it's about the camera. It's not about the camera. The whole question centers around data management. It is a data management problem. And a big piece of that data management problem is how do you effectively, quickly, and cost-effectively push out the appropriate records to the public? So the, the short answer is yes. That is a question that must absolutely be answered by the council. And I was gonna wait, but since we're having this conversation now, um, I'm, I guess the question around public records request is who's the public? If somebody's asking for it so that they can make money off of the data because they're trying to sell a service, I don't see that as a member of the public, right? Uh, if I've been injured, however, and I need a copy of the police report so that I can file with my insurance company, I am then a member of the public. 
And so I, I think we have to have a policy around who is the public, right? And unlike at the federal level, we don't think corporations are people. So I don't think we would be Im implementing a policy that would treat them the same way we would, say, a crime victim or someone who needs information because they've been individually impacted. And so I, would, I, I don't want us to just lump public record requests because they're not all the same and they don't all serve the same purpose, right? Uh, the other question that I'll just put out there, and I guess we'll have this conversation another day, is I, I'm still concerned that the city attorney uh, counsels the council as well as the police. And I, I think that there's, there, there should be like a wall divide because I don't think you can counsel the people who supervise the police in the same way you would counsel an employee, right? And, and so it's not... That's a much longer conversation. I just wanted to put it out there because we're going we're gonna to be out of time. So I, I would just like to very briefly respond to that, which um, two things. One, I completely uh, agree on the policy. I think legally, uh, everybody who requests a public record is a member of the public. However, in terms of our fee waivers and that sort of thing, we may treat them differently, and I agree that we should. In terms of the police question, we represent the city of Portland. The policy for the city of Portland is established by the Portland City Council. We take our policy direction from the Portland City Council, so we provide the legal services to the police bureau that you all want us to provide. We advise them in accordance with your policy direction. That's how I see our role. That's a longer conversation. Very good. Uh, we did it. If you need to come back or if people have follow-up questions, we'll make sure that that happens. All right. So just let me know that. Thank good. you. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>